It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Brianna Wu is here. She's running for Congress in the Massachusetts 8th District and is also a developer. Lisa Schmeiser, editor from IT Pro Today, and our favorite Mark Million, technology editor at Bloomberg Business Week. We're going to talk about Mark Zuckerberg's apology tour and his congressional testimony on Tuesday. Apple making its own chips and the future as seen in Ready Player One. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 661, recorded Sunday, April 8th, 2018. The Ant Man Cannon. This Week in Tech is brought to you by WordPress. Reach more customers when you build your business website on WordPress.com. Plans start at just $4 a month. Get 15% off any new plan purchase at WordPress.com slash twit. And by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first order with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. And by FreshBooks. Join over 10 million people using FreshBooks to painlessly send invoices, track time, and capture expenses. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash twit. And by the Ring Video Doorbell. Stop crime before it happens and help make your neighborhood safer with Ring. Go to ring.com slash twit and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we get together with some of the smartest people in technology. Shh, talk about the week's tech news. We got, we got the real deal today. Joining us from left to right, Mark Millian. He's from Bloomberg. He is technology editor. We've known him for years since he was a small child, practically. Maybe, probably approaching a decade at this point yeah. since I first came on the show. Because you were at the LA Times then. Yeah. The boy wonder at the LA Times. <laughs> and uh, you're still kind of boyish, but, you know, you're now big shot. So that's good. I like, no, you were always a big shot. You All right. Big always shot. good to be here. So great to see you. Thank you for being here. Mark, also from, uh, oh, I got to say the new name, right? IT Pro Today. IT Pro Today. Lisa Schmeiser, who is Hello. editor at IT Pro Today. Hello. Good to see you. Formerly, can I say it used to be the Super Safe for Windows? Super and now Safe for Windows, yes. Completely remodeled, restyled, mm -hmm. looking better than ever. Paul Thorat's going, darn it. Mm. IT Pro, <laughs> IT you know, Pro Paul, Today. Paul, Paul does his site, and his site is good, too. So nah, it's, it's, well, he's looking back thinking, mm. I don't know. I don't know. Oh. ITProToday.com. Great to have you, Lisa. And from the Massachusetts 8th District, where she is a candidate for U.S. Congress, Brianna Wu. <laughs> so good to be here. Nice I'm so sorry you. I couldn't be in studio today. The idea was Brianna was coming out here, uh, and we were going to have everybody in studio, but... Mm -hmm. You know what? When you're running for Congress, you're no longer your own master, are you? It's so true. It sucks. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was, you know, I mean, we had some great events. We did some good television. But, you know, I would honestly rather be out in San Francisco talking tech with you. So When's the primary? It is. It is. Oh, when is the primary? Yeah. It's in September. So you have, mm -hmm. so this is, it's going to start getting serious now. You have three, well, three four months. Well, it's been serious for a long time. Yeah. yeah. We're, yeah. Uh, so what's happening next week is we've connect, we've uh, collected almost enough signatures to get on the ballot. So we have to start taking them to every single city. And then they compare the names of the, the people that signed the petition to get us on the ballot Holy uh, versus the records. So. You know, I'm going to spend the next week, uh, basically my team going to different uh, circuit clerk's offices. You got a lot of work ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah! Holy cow! Um, don't know where I want to start here. Uh, I guess we could probably mention. Mm -hmm. it, ha it seems like it's been more than a week since the YouTube shooting, but it it, oh. it, it did. It was oh. this week, wasn't yeah. it? It was yeah. a long yeah, week. Tuesday. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's been a long week. <laughs> It's it's a it's a sad. F I don't think I think only the shooter died. Everybody mm -hmm. else has survived. Yeah. Some in critical yeah. condition, but there were three people shot. 
Uh, the shooter we now know was a disgruntled YouTuber mm -hmm. who yeah. felt that she had not been uh, allowed to monetize. They had cut off. She says, I'm being discriminated. Mm -hmm. She felt she didn't get the views she deserved. Mm. Um, you know, I, this is just, just a tragedy. I don't know there, what, how much more there is to say about it, but I wanted to acknowledge it. Uh, her, there, you know, there's not much you can do in this country. Mm -hmm. Her dad had called the police. Her brother had uh, said there's a problem. Uh, yeah. But there, you can't arrest somebody for being, mm -hmm. you know, seeming dangerous. And uh, unfortunately, she uh, she acted out with a gun at the YouTube yeah. headquarters in San Bruno. Yeah. Could have been worse, I guess, is the only thing I can say. And I feel I feel bad for her family. Of course, I feel bad for the families of the people affected. But uh, part of this comes from the the the. The, I think something that's always bothered me, and I don't blame YouTube for this at all, but one thing that's always blamed, bothered me about YouTube is they really trumpet the YouTube stars, the 10 or 20 people yeah. who make money, mm -hmm. and they downplay the fact that that's a really tiny minority out mm -hmm. of the, all the people who work like the Dickens to create content on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, I think that pr probably she got a little bit bit mm -hmm. by this culture that I have the, I should be doing, I should be one of them. Yeah. Well, the demonet uh, demonetization also hit a lot of people across YouTube hard. I just pulled up a Bloomberg story from December of last year when YouTube changed its algorithm. And it's a, Bloom it's a Bloomberg story. Very nice. Um, <laughs> so now you have to have and, uh, a thousand followers there, well, there was and 4,000 views. on here named Joe hours. Taylor who um, used to run a motorcycle, who runs a motorcycle focus challenge called JoGo 101. Yeah. And after YouTube shifted its algorithm and began demonetizing videos, his revenue dropped from six thousand dollars a month to one thousand dollars a month mm -hmm. so you're looking at over an 80 percent drop in revenue for somebody and a lot of these people do quit their jobs and try to do this full time and yeah. unless you have enough money in the bank to weather an 80 percent drop in revenue that you cannot control because you have no transparency into how these videos are exposed or pushed out um, it's not a viable business model, but I don't think a lot of YouTubers know that. They focus yeah. more yeah. on the production aspect. And a lot of them are young, and, yeah. hope to become stars. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was an extreme, horrible, inappropriate reaction from yeah. this woman, but it's it, this is like the heart of one of the biggest issues for YouTube as a company, mm -hmm. is balancing yeah. the uh, sort of the growth of a uh, certain user base and appeasing advertisers mm -hmm. and... The, you know, a large base of people who want to make a living on their platform. And mm -hmm. like, I've, I think there have been some studies recently of uh, like asking kids what careers they aspire to be. And YouTube, YouTube YouTubers stars like near up. the top of the list. Yeah. Every, every yeah. 12 year old I meet wants to be a Minecraft video creator on yeah. YouTube and be a star. But to Lisa's point, there's like very few people who are able to make a living off of yeah. that. Yeah. Mark, can I can I add something on to that? You know, I studied journalism in college um, and our program was separated into two parts. You had the television part and you had the print journalism part. And for me, the print journalism people were the ones that re that's what I did. Shoe leather work, going out, looking at public records, doing interviews. And then the other people in the department kind of were the ones that really wanting to be on television. That was their their goal to get that attention. And I've always felt that, yeah, you know, I think like everyone here in the studio today, like we're here because we put our passion of knowledge and reporting, you know, our career first. And I think that's what leads to the wider success, if that makes sense to you. So like my number one suggestion to anyone that comes up to me is like, like how do I make a career or get a podcast? It's like become really good at what you do professionally and then the rest of it, I think, flows from there. Yeah, I mean, the argu again, the, her argument was not appropriate. Yeah, uh, like yeah, the that's way not she, how you she, handle it. She, she yeah. Yeah, but she I, was bad, I don't but know. She, I'm not a psychologist, yeah. but it feels like she had a, a break. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, she had this. She was living in a of, car, yeah. and, yeah. Uh, and yeah. the, she, her, par her family knew that there was something bad yeah. going on. They'd filed a missing yeah. report. It, it does yeah. point to um, one of the perils of building your business brand or your business model on any sort of network that you don't own. But you look like at this Instagram. with Instagram, right? I was just about to say, like Instagram, um, Facebook. Uh, you, there was a content farm that recently went out of business after Facebook changed its algorithm because it was mm -hmm. no longer driving traffic. Again. Going in and shooting up a workplace is never an appropriate response to anything. Um, 
and it's clear that it, that YouTube didn't cause whatever break she had, but it does also point out that the way YouTube is running its business model, it wouldn't hurt for journalists like us to start looking at, well, exactly how well-versed in the way YouTube works are the people who try to make their living on it. And yeah. are they considering what's going to happen if this platform becomes less viable over time? Um, or if they are the ones who no longer get picked up by an algorithm yeah, or, think, or things like that. It's um, the peril of depending on any network that you don't own for your business model is the minute that that network decides they can make money doing something differently, they will. And it's either up to you to scramble to catch up with it. Or so, I mean, wouldn't that be an argument though? I think one of the biggest issues, if we mm -hmm. want to get this to be wider than video, mm -hmm. um, you know, media publishers uh, mm -hmm. like Joshua Topolsky, he started the outline, right? He is very much at the mercy of Facebook's algorithm as far as getting his stories out there. Mm -hmm. um, that's basically a monopoly. When you're looking at broadcasting video content in many ways, uh, YouTube is a monopoly. I use Vimeo, but it just doesn't have the the same audience. So yeah. I think, you know, I I think if I were elected, I would want to start to take a hard look at what mm -hmm. certainly seems to be a duopoly as far as broadcasting this content, because you shouldn't be at the mercy of any one individual company. Mm -hmm. I think it would be better for everyone if there was more competition in this mm -hmm. space. At the same time, I don't feel like this is a f the fault of YouTube or no, Facebook no, or no, Instagram. No, no. They created a business that was wildly successful yeah. Yeah. and fulfilled an amazing uh, need. I mean, uh, you know, Siva Vaidyanathan, we talked about mm -hmm. this on Wednesday on This Week in Google, said the people who say leave Facebook are actually not being realistic. They don't understand that in many parts of the world, Facebook, Facebook is, is the only provider. way, it's your internet, it's the only yeah. way we yeah. communicate. That yeah. is, yeah. I guess you could ascribe a little bit of that uh, fault to that, to maybe these companies... Uh, when they misuse their monopoly. Yeah. But most of the, it, it seems to me most of the time, yeah. this is just they're really doing well. Yeah. So, yeah. so let me ask that question philosophically, because I think in this country, we've always this celebrated yeah. rags to riches and building something great and having a great success. Mm -hmm. And there's always been a little resistance to the idea that when you get to a certain size that the government says, no, nah, you're too big, you yeah. can't be that big. I The government... I don't think anybody uh, contests the government's role in antitrust, that if you yeah. have a monopoly in a business and you start to use that monopoly to kill other businesses to disadvantage consumers, that's wrong and, and that needs to be regulated. But what if Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon don't do monopolistic things? They're just super successful. Yeah. Should we, what do you think, Brianna? Is that cause for regulation? I think it's really tough, right? Because look at WhatsApp, right? Like Facebook bought that and then they rolled that and eventually turned it into Facebook Messenger, which is a tool I use all the time. It's an excellent app. So I think it's really hard because you have these larger companies and smaller companies are funded in the VC system with the assumption that someone like Facebook or Google or Amazon is eventually going to buy them, but it also creates a situation where it's not realistic to think they'll ever get taken over. Like if some fundamental shift in social media happens, Facebook will be right there to either duplicate those features mm -hmm. or to, you know, buy that company outright. So I'm I'm not going to tell you it's straightforward or simple. I'm just saying there are things we need to start thinking about because it is very clearly a duopoly with the ad business. Yeah. Yeah. But Mark, I know there's also a strong current of thought among, especially this is especially true among technologists, that you don't even have to worry because the, at the pace technology moves and the way technology moves, nobody's advantage is permanent. Yeah, I, if you talk to the people inside YouTube, which we have reporters who do, um, they don't think that they're on top of the world. They're looking at Netflix and they're looking at Hulu and they're looking at what Apple's pouring into online video and Amazon's pouring into online video. And they 
in many ways want their business to look more like Netflix. They're trying to do more like high quality content and working with the studios. Is that because subscriber streams are a more reliable form of revenue than say advertising buys, which can go up and down depending? Subscriber is, yes, that's mm -hmm. subscriptions are good, but also yeah. advertisers will pay more for quality content than they will for yeah. potentially that's having their ads next to yeah. Nazi videos. YouTube. Right, that you don't, yeah. as an advertiser, you don't know what you're gonna be on. Yeah. Uh, I suppose you could say, well, not on that channel, not on that channel, not on that yeah. channel. But if you don't, and this, Twitter has a similar problem. If you can't say my advertisement is going to appear in a place, that, that's why we do well. Because they know what they're getting yeah. when they advertise here. But you don't know what you're getting when you advertise If you can't YouTube. control what you're associated with, you can yeah. find yourself as the target of a boycott or a, right. pub or a public outrage machine. With, Did you know that you're supporting such and such? Right. And, then, and we've seen that Then happen. you're playing defense. Yeah. Um, no, but YouTube make, now YouTube, is YouTube profitable? Yes. It is. Yes. <laughs> and it's certainly high revenue, many billions yeah. of dollars in revenue. Yeah, and there was a lot of, when they bought it for a billion dollars, there was People a lot of People thought they were that. crazy. Yeah. Because they were in the midst of lawsuits with NBC. They, I thought, in fact, I remember deeply talking. deeply unprofitable. Yeah, I, I remember talking mm -hmm. to the founder, Steve Chen, and um, I can't remember the other guy's name. But we interviewed them on Net at Night before they were purchased. And I said, how are you going to survive? You're going to be sued out of business. All of the content... Mm -hmm. That's really successful. And at the time, it was stuff from Saturday Night Live, and, and NBC mm -hmm. was furious. <laughs> All the content that's making you money, yeah. you're going to get pulled down. But I think what happened is NBC realized, oh, you know what? We shouldn't sue them. This is really good promotion. This is Saturday Night Live suddenly is getting viewers. <laughs> they found that out with um, the Jimmy Fallon show. It's better to post yeah. on YouTube. Yeah, because it builds up a completely different Bet. audience. There have, there have been, um, I read an article about how the Jimmy Fallon show does better precisely because they do try to do a lot of viral clips and that builds awareness among audiences that are not routinely late night TV watchers, but now become so. Thanks. Yeah. I also should point out mm -hmm. that while YouTube is making tons of money, not mm -hmm. a lot of that money, we don't know how much goes back to the creators, yeah. right? I mean, we, mm -hmm. they never have admitted how much money goes back to the creators. Yeah. I doubt it's half. Yeah, 30%? Yeah. We don't know. Revenue for uh, YouTube, let's see, I'm... Uh, this is Alphabet. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can break it down. This is the other problem. You must have this problem all the time in Bloomberg. Companies no longer report. They no longer <laughs> give you information. Even publicly held companies that ought to be telling you how many Apple watches were sold or how much money YouTube makes, they lump it all together. They give yeah. you as little information as they possibly can. Let me look this up in my Bloomberg terminal here. I was just about to ask, can you look up the latest? Oh, see, um, he's got access, man. Can you look up the latest SEC filings? Google, they have it Google has 42% of the U.S. ad market for digital ads. Yeah. Facebook, 23%. So between the two of them, 65% mm -hmm. of the digital ad spending yeah. goes to those two companies. That right wow. there tells it's you something. It's only supposed to rise. Too. And it's yeah. it's only going to get to, I mean, it's going to be 100% yeah. pretty quick, I think. What, I'd what, ask is, what does your ter terminal tell you? Did uh, you bring your magic card? Well, it breaks it down by advertising revenue and other yeah, see, revenue. They won't, yeah, yeah but, see, they won't. And I think they've broken it out under display, mm -hmm. which includes video and ah. graphical ads, which okay. are not a huge business for Google, um, but I, I'm not finding that immediately. I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the results and they don't, they don't really say how much YouTube is, yeah. is uh, making. They're making money overall, uh, no question about uh, that. So I, I think this is a kind of, the, if you're gonna say the big story of 2018 in general is about the growth of these companies we interviewed a, a professor at NYU last year, Scott Galloway, about his book, The Four. Mm -hmm. And this is what he was saying is these big companies, I think his four were Amazon. Did he do Fang? It, Facebook, was it Fangs? Amazon, I, don't think Netflix, Flick, Flix I don't think Netflix was in there. Okay. Those are the Fangs. I just learned that term. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Amazon. I I've been watching CNBC a lot, mm -hmm. Lisa. That's why yeah. I know that. Mm -hmm. the, they're all talking about the Fangs. <laughs> Uh, it was it was Amazon, Google, they Microsoft, do fong and with Facebook. With the long A, when you throw an Apple too, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, Netflix was not in there, but I, but it, maybe it should have been. Yeah. Um, he talked about the fact that these guys are getting so big, so powerful, and so you look at this with Facebook. I mean, there's no question, for good or ill, that Facebook had a huge impact on the 2016 election, and thereby had a huge impact on the world. Same thing in in the Philippines, Myanmar, all mm -hmm. over the world. Facebook has a huge impact, for Brexit. good or for ill. I'm not going to make any judgment on it. Uh, YouTube, Google, Search, th mm -hmm. these companies are, if you don't, for instance, if Google doesn't list you in its search, it's as if you were taken off the internet. That's yeah. how powerful these companies are, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Galloway is saying, these companies better watch out. Now, he said this last year, and I think it's starting to come true this year. 
these companies better watch out because gov governments, particularly the U.S. government, are going to start sitting up and taking notice and starting yeah. to, to regulate you. So if you don't yeah. self-regulate, you're going to be regulated. Mark Zuckerberg is going to be testifying in Congress this yeah. week on uh, on the yeah. 11th. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I have a, a particularly unique point of view on this because – like for us, we are a political campaign that runs on issues like privacy, net neutrality, um, you know, encryption. These are really hardcore key tech issues that don't have a broad appeal. And I benefit every single day from being able to go on Facebook and get ads and to really find that audience in a way that I could not a decade ago. And that is what has let me create a successful political campaign. It's micro-targeting. I personally benefit from that. At the same time, it is so unregulated and it's not held to the same standards as print or television or magazines. And you know, I could put an ad out that could say, anything, literally anything. And there's no check on who's paying for it. There's no check on what the content is. It's just really, it's it's a jungle. And while it's certainly more convenient for me to not have to jump through any hurdles, I don't really think it's good for democracy. So I think you know, this is one of these things where it's not, it's too simplistic to say like Facebook is just terrible because micro-targeting is good. It has benefits. It lets new constituencies be heard. At the same time, I think we would all agree that like outside nations should not be buying ads to influence American elections. It's really tough because you're exactly yeah. right. And I think a lot of people, a lot of Trump supporters say, oh, you, you Clinton supporters are just whining because you didn't use Facebook as well as we did. Mm. And there may be some merit to yeah. that, you know? I mean, yeah. um, Well, wasn't the argument flipped around when, when Barack Obama's team in 2008? And Obama used Facebook very effectively. Yeah. Well, he used, in they 2012, used to, not in 2008. In 2008, they did great data mining. And, right. their, and they did great work with email but and they targeting didn't have different segments. Facebook to no, use. No, but, but, but the point is, is, is they set up precedent in 2008 yes. with the way that they said data can be used to build a political I campaign it very well and data can be used to build your audience and to figure out how much they can give to you how often you can reliably hit them up what appeals they're going to use things like that in obama 2012 the obama mm -hmm. campaign used the information they had about who had voted for them in 2008 yeah. to get out the vote in 2012 mm -hmm. and I, th yeah. I think that that's actually legitimate that's yeah. a legitimate use of, of micro targeting yeah. Um, so there are legitimate uses for it. So it is. It's very. This is very challenging to say that. Uh, for instance, we're well, talking about yeah. are these companies misusing monopoly? It's very hard to to say that Apple, because Apple doesn't make Messenger available for non-Apple platforms, mm -hmm. is that monopolistic? Is that no? Because Apple's not a monopoly, and yet it yeah. feels like anti-competitive behavior. Yeah, well, you're talking I don't envy being, you, Brianna. If you get elected, yeah. <laughs> you got a challenging. Well, you're talking about targeting, though. The thing is, is how well educated are we as targets? How easy is That's, it? How to me, easy I is feel it like for it's us? Our responsibility well, how easy more. is it for us to to, yeah. to learn the skills necessary to figure out who's targeting you, why they're targeting you, what what the triggers right. were that 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 tripped that off? Um, and we, I think it's the been easy to do that in retail, for example. The but, platforms need to be responsible you know. to your to your uh, point, uh, Brianna. Facebook announced that this week that they're going to require verified identities for future mm -hmm. political ads. Yeah. This is something that was not required of digital platforms, well, it was always required of broadcast platforms, mm -hmm. that if you buy an ad on radio or TV, that ad has to be clearly identified who's paying for it. But yeah. digital, that's why Russians could buy ads, because there yeah. was no requirement. Facebook unilaterally, not because of regulation, but unilaterally said, mm -hmm. all right, from now on, we are going to make sure we know who's buying those ads and that those ads are identified as being bought by somebody, eliminating, I guess, Russian influence. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing I would hope these platforms would start to do. Yeah. Right. Um, responsibly self-regulate. It's a kind of thing that Congress, it's hard for... We can barely get Congress to do anything. Yeah, it's true. And some of I these really nitty the gritty details. Well, one of the I things do have to say the tech subcommittee is only, um, you know, it's it's basically eight votes control the tech subcommittee. So you don't have to get all of Congress to That's understand to stuff because, like, this particular committee does their work and it gets rolled into larger appropriations bills. So, you know, that's, that's the way subcommittees work. We don't have to educate all of Congress on this. I do have to say, like, we're talking at micro-targeting. 
this is legit. I think no one on the show would disagree with this. Like this is a positive use of technology. But one of the things was, um, you know, a topic that we were thinking about talking about this week was Kara Swisher's interview with Mark Zuckerberg. And one of my absolute favorite moment in there where she got him dead to rights is she started talking about Facebook's um, plan to basically make apps that were built into Facebook where app developers could basically pull all of this data. And back in 2014, I condemned this. Every technology journalist condemned it. Everyone could see this mess coming from a mile away. And Facebook came with this kind of tech utopianism. And they just ignored it and marched forward with it. And then Cambridge Analytica happened. And I think we're not, no one would argue about like micro targeting being an issue. But when anyone can get basically all this creepy amount of information about you, where you are, what you buy, like the exact locations that you go to, and can copy it and can use it for anything. That is really going so far that I do think it fundamentally threatens our democracy. So I agree, like government regulation gives me intense pause, but there's also something. There's something fundamentally wrong with Facebook where we keep having this discussion. And Mark Zuckerberg has been apologizing for these exact issues for 15 years now. Well, that's the irony of this, is if you read Mark's apologies, going back to his freshman year at Harvard, <laughs> yeah. when he apologized for face mash, which was pre-Facebook, <laughs> it was a thing he made. It, it's in the movie, not that the movie was particularly accurate, but if you mm -hmm. saw the movie, you saw that he scraped pictures of Harvard students from the Harvard intranet mm -hmm. uh, and created a hot or not app that people would vote on it. And it raised a huge furor, and he had to write an apology in the mm -hmm. Harvard Crimson, yeah. which... Actually, find it because uh, uh, Zainab Tafiki wrote about this uh, in Wired this week. Sounds exactly like the apologies we're continuing to hear from Mark, almost word for word. Oh, I have it up here. Well, yeah, it's go ahead and read it if you want. The first apology from the Harvard Crimson is right, right at the top. She calls it his 14 year apology tour. Yep. I can read it. I've got it here. Okay, she said, yeah, This is Mark Harvard writing Crimson's. in the Harvard Crimson. See if this sounds familiar. I hope you understand this is not how I meant for things to go, and I apologize for any harm done as a result of my neglect to consider how quickly the site would spread and its consequences thereafter. I definitely see how my intentions could have been seen in the wrong light. The problem is Mark's been doing this since 2003. He's always apologized. He's always said we're going to do better. This is when the, the news feed was launched, which I forgot upset a lot of people because mm -hmm. they thought they were sharing with family and friends and suddenly their shares were showing up in the news feed. This was a big mistake on our part, says Mark, and I'm sorry for it. We really messed this one up. We did a bad job of explaining what the new features were and an even worse job of getting in control of them. 2007, remember the Beacon advertising system? Mm -hmm. This offended me because I would see, my friends would see ads that said, Leo Laporte just bought adult diapers. Would you like to? <laughs> and that's offensive. There was Don't a judge my private life. <laughs> Fifty thousand Facebook users signed a petition saying, "Facebook, stop invading my privacy." Here's, mm -hmm. listen to the words. Mm -hmm. We simply did a bad job with this release, and I apologize for it. I'm not proud with the, the way we handle the situation. I know we can do better. Except they never. Has anyone ever, ever asked him how they ever did better? Following, do. A, following a following a, a, a thing. I know we can do better. Well, how, how have you done better from the last time you We said just you missed did? the yeah. mark. Another time, 2010. Yeah. We heard the feedback. There needs to be a simpler way to control your information. In the coming weeks, we'll add privacy controls that are simpler to use. That's in 2010. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Zainab says, I'm going to run out of space. So let's jump yeah. to 2018. It goes on and on. Uh, and it's not, oh, now I have to say, I have a personal opinion about Mark that is not informed by uh, having ever met him or knowing mm -hmm. anything about him. And I'm afraid it's a fairly negative opinion. So I'm going to stand back and recuse myself from this. <laughs> but, but I do feel like, remember, he is he has voting control of the company. He has never given up enough of the company to lose total control. Yeah. Zuckerberg is an absolute control of Facebook. There's nobody else. The board can't fire him. Nothing, you know, I'm sure he hears voices from other people, I hope. But uh, <laughs> that he gets As to choose. As opposed to hearing them from where? Inside <laughs> his head? Yeah, uh, you never know. 
Yeah. I know that's un that's unfair, yeah. Mark. I'm yeah. sorry, but uh, but I don't feel I feel like he, he doesn't get it, or he doesn't care, yeah. and he continues mm -hmm. to break the rules. And yeah. I think at some point we need to say, okay, Mark, time's up. Yeah, is that just me, Leo? I I really want to back up everything you just said. You know. A question I get a lot recently is, okay, Bree, you're talking a lot about Facebook. Why aren't you talking more about Google? Good question. And I can say, mm -hmm. in my personal opinion, I know a lot of people that work at both of those companies. I genuinely see, like, Google is not a company without problems. But I genuinely see when Google messes up, I think they they have, gen, generally speaking, done better at solving it in a realistic way and moving forward. Look at Android. I think if you look at the subsequent uh, releases of Android, they've clearly moved in the right direction for privacy and uh, like informing users about what's going on and what data they're giving up. So I think Google clearly has issues. And if I'm elected, like I will certainly be having conversations with them. But there seems to be a fundamental disconnect from reality in what Facebook says and what happens there. And what has worried me a great deal is some of the conversations I've had in the past few weeks with people that work at Facebook. It's not generous, but I, I, I don't feel like they're realistic mm -hmm. about the problems that they're facing. They're, I, um, in some yeah. ways, maybe they're true believers, you know? Yeah. They really believe yeah. in how they're changing the world by connecting people. That's a positive. Yeah. It's like that memo, the Bosworth memo, where he mm -hmm. said, well, terrorists are going to use it. But we, in the long run, we make a bigger difference. Right. So it's okay. Mm. Yeah. And, I, and you know what? You know, I, I kind of understand that. That's the same explanation Phil Zimmerman gave me mm -hmm. when I asked him about PGP. He said, Phil, you've invented a technology <laughs> that lets bad guys talk to each other uh completely anonymously he said well you create the technology it's a it's a net good because privacy is important can't mm -hmm. stop it from being misused yeah mm -hmm. I, don't, I we this is a conversation that's going to be going on all year i don't mm -hmm. do it every show i'm sorry i don't mean to i didn't mean to bring it up again of course we're going to watch with interest what mark sex mm -hmm. says to congress but i don't feel like he'll say anything that is materially going to change the fact nope. of nope. this is how Facebook's designed. This is its business model. This is what it's going to continue to do. Mm. Nope. And uh, I don't know if the government should regulate it. I, uh, Jeff Jarvis got furious at me on Wednesday. For, I, I said, mm -hmm. oh, they should just shut it down. <laughs> he said, you can't do that. I said, no, I don't mean that. Government mm -hmm. shouldn't ever do that. But, uh, well, maybe shouldn't yeah. uh, ever do that. No, but I don't think maybe, so. Maybe, maybe the market should. I, I think they need to be, I think a good place to start is if they are reckless in how third parties use um, the data that they're given, I would like to see them opened up to civil liability. Um, wow. I think a lot of the time, the way to solve this is we value money in yeah. the United States more than people and certainly more than privacy. So I think if we open them up to civil liability, if neglect on their part leads to these huge data breaches that abuse um, you know, all of our data and open us up to identity theft, I, I think that is one tenable solution. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think I mentioned this uh, last week. Corey Doctorow was on the new screen service two weeks ago. We love Corey. I love his mm -hmm. point of view and all of this. Yeah. He said, there's two things that can really make a difference here. One, um, and I hope you will help do this, Brianna, is eliminate the rules that require, I do. I think you were on when we talked about this, actually, that require uh, arbitration, uh, that yeah. allow people to, to, to sue if necessary to protect their privacy. If Equifax yeah. loses your mm -hmm. data, you know, most of us have contracts with these companies that say you 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 yeah. you could go into mandatory arbitration and 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 it's binding. Mm -hmm. uh, eliminate that and say no, you can sue. You have the yep. right to take them to court. And the other thing Corey said, which I think is more important for our audience, is if you don't like it, build your own. Mm. Let's build some let's build some social networks that are privacy forward. Uh, yeah, that connect people without, um, you know. So the. This is not me saying it's a bad idea, but what I'm saying is with that kind of solution, what you're basically acknowledging is that privacy is a luxury that you should be able to buy and sell. It's not an inherent civic right. Well, it isn't in the Constitution, but no. I guess the courts have eventually... Well, um, no, and I'm, and I'm not saying... 
a legal thing either way. What I'm saying is when you're like, well, if you don't like this social network, which does not afford you any measure of data transparency or data privacy, you have to build one it. where the marketable right. feature of your right. social network is either data transparency or data privacy. You're not challenging the notion that privacy is a commodity which can be bought, sold, or monetized. Right. And the question I'm uh, asking is, is privacy actually some sort of civic right or is it merely a, a construct that may be going out of style? Yeah, I mean, I bought my second iPhone 10 last week, uh, like a separate phone for call time because, you know, iPhone is the platform that has better security. And, you know, we, we have to take that incredibly serious on my campaign. And as I'm sitting there buying my second, what is it, $1,200, $1,400 phone, I'm going like, <laughs> yeah. this is this is really privilege. It is. This is it privilege. Is. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is a great, and I encourage everybody to uh, mm -hmm. to read it. Uh, medium post from Greg Ferenstein, mm -hmm. The Birth and Death of Privacy, 300 Years of History Told Through 46 Images, which will tell you a lot about, you know, our notion of modern notion of privacy yeah. is very different from the historic notion of privacy. People yeah. all slept in one room together until relatively recently. Yeah. Most homes oh. didn't have walls separating rooms yeah. until 1500 AD. To that oh. point, there was a really good, um, the former Monty Python, Terry Jones, um, or former current, I never know, they're, they're quantum. If, yes, um, <laughs> he's a python. But he wrote a really great book about the Tower of London. And one of the mind blowing things that got me is he said, you have to understand that for years, comfort was not a physical con concept. Like the idea that you should be physically comfortable in a space didn't really hit popular consciousness until about the 1800s. Comfort was more a psychological thing. And a lot of courtly life and the idea of comfort revolved around the social relationships you had one-on-one -on -one and how other people watched you have them too. So Pri that, that ties into this as well. It was well. the opposite of privacy. Yeah, but that ties into the idea of privacy as well. Is, so we're is, getting back to that now with Instagram and yeah, Twitter. Yeah, you lived your life very You lived your life very much in public and yeah. people could comment on how you comported yourself. Beds, beds your used to be so expensive that yeah. most people didn't have their own bed till 1700. Yeah. For wow. most of the history of humanity, yeah. we all slept in the same bed. Well, Information they, privacy is yeah. very new. Well, the phrase make yeah. your bed comes down to people literally having to fill a sack with straw. <laughs> and Speaking of comfort, yeah. <laughs> I should do a Casper ad here, but I don't yeah. have one. But <laughs> let's, let's, You're let's, missing uh, out, Casper. Get on Leo. <laughs> uh, let's take a break. Uh, yeah. This is a I highly recommend anybody who mm -hmm. uh, wants to think about this, uh, this, this kind of history of privacy from a medium uh, is r the, the Ferenstein Wire. Uh, Vint Cerf, he's quoting Vint Cerf, privacy may actually be an anomaly. Um, it is kind of more modern, and uh, it's really fascinating to just learn a little bit of the history. That really helps inform the conversation about, well, wh what does it mean? to wh Why do we want privacy? Maybe it isn't something that belongs in the yeah. civic sphere. Maybe it, it's fascinating, frankly. All right, let's take a break. We've got a great panel. Uh, Mark Millian is here from Bloomberg. He is editor, technology editor there. Great to have you, Mark. Lisa Schmeiser. From itprotoday.com. Mm -hmm. She's editor there. And Brianna Wu, who is a developer, of course. In fact, before the show, we were talking about computer programming. That was so much fun, mm -hmm. Brianna. You know, <laughs> frankly, I didn't start Twit to talk about political issues, monopolies, companies getting too large, privacy. I started Twit to talk about programming, mm -hmm. which ah. processor to buy. <laughs> That's what I really would like to talk about. I'm sure our audience would too. Mm. But but technology is so important nowadays that that conversation really has bled into the public uh, sphere. It's really what we it's all true. need to talk about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, great to have you. Good luck running for Congress in Massachusetts 8th District. Thank you. And if you see a petitioner outside your local uh, <laughs> Piggly Wiggly, and what is the what is the grocery store in Massachusetts? You know, Whole Foods is big. Uh, okay. Whole Foods, there are a lot of hippies good place that go there. Good place so for very signing. Very good for Democrats. Yeah. Yes. Is that where you put your petition gatherers? <laughs> put, them out, put them out front of Whole Foods. So if you see we somebody do. with a clipboard outside of Whole Foods and you can say, yeah, put Brianna Wu on the ballot, you do that. Will you please? Absolutely. Do you have to be in the Massachusetts 8th to do that? Uh, you, yes, you absolutely must be. Uh, and you can, you cannot be a registered Republican or a registered Libertarian. You can be anything else, be but not uh, those two things. Oh, okay. So you don't have to be a Democratic voter. You could just nope. be independent. You can be independent. Absolutely. Okay, the, that's also, those laws are really weird. 
It's, it's, uh, <laughs> Those laws are so I, arcane. I could talk about it all day, Leo. Yeah. I really California, could. we did all sorts of weird things where anybody could vote for anybody. And, oh, my God, it's crazy. And to the point where we had a district uh, last election that had two Democrats running against each other. Mm -hmm. It's like, you, okay. Uh, our show today brought to you. I actually, and people will think this funny when I say this, but I like having the Republican Party and the Democratic mm -hmm. Party. I like the byplay of, of, of philosophies. We need that conversation. That's what we're yeah. losing with this huge polarization is the civil conversation between opposing points of view. We need that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't, I don't want a uniformity of, of point of view. Mm -hmm. I just want us to be able to talk, please. Our show today brought now. Now we can talk about WordPress.com. Uh, this is where I host my blog, where so many people I know, including like really smart people like Steve Gibson, who actually runs a server in his house. But when it comes to making a blog, WordPress.com. That explains a little bit about why 30% of all the websites in the world, 30%, close to one third, run on WordPress. WordPress is awesome. I love it. And when you get hosting at WordPress.com, you're joining a global community. You can, people at WordPress, you get, there's a front page. People follow you there. Plus, they do all the hard work. They keep WordPress up to date. They keep the plugins up to date. They have hundreds of great templates. I used to run my own WordPress. Man, I am so glad I moved to WordPress.com. It's so much easier. And by the way, it's a lot less expensive than what I was paying to run my own server and do my own support and all of that stuff. WordPress.com. It gives you the freedom and flexibility to share your voice yeah, you know, it's okay to have a Facebook page and a Twitter account. It's okay to post on Instagram, but you really need one place that's your place that you own, that you live on. That's your site at WordPress.com. You need support, Everett. Their customer support team is really great, really smart, fast to respond, and they're there 24-7 Monday through Friday, weekends too. They, if you want to sell, I mean, I use it for my personal blog, but you want to put your business on there and sell, they have great e-commerce options, everything from a simple and effective buy button to a complete online store. And plans start as low as $4 a month. And, of course, they have all of the things you need, SEO automatically, social sharing, which is great. Your readers can share, they'll spread the word about your business or personal life or whatever it is they're sharing on their Twitter and on their Facebook. They've got plugins for all you. I use the Google Amped plugin. I've got HTTPS turned on. It's got everything you want. It's affordable. It's easy. It's fast. Focus on the content. Focus on your business. Focus on doing what you do. Let WordPress.com handle the rest. Get started today with 15% off any new plan purchase at WordPress.com slash twit. Create your website, WordPress.com slash twit. 15% off right now when you go to wordpress.com slash twit. And we thank WordPress not only for their support of the show, but really <laughs> for making my life uh, easier. You got to have your own site. So um, Apple a year ago. Whew, yeah, we're changing the, changing the course of the stream. Is that why you said? <laughs> oh, well, this is, the, there's so much that's interesting and awesome to talk about with Apple this week. You're talking agree. about how... You didn't want to talk about politics? I'm excited because we're about to talk about changing chip architecture for an entire yeah, operating that system. that is interesting. So. All right, well, let's start with that one. The Mark Berman <laughs> said that Apple by 2020 will be making its own chips for everything, including its Macintosh mm -hmm. computers, Intel wow. outside. Uh, Intel stock plummeted, even though, funnily enough, there really was no reason because Apple's only about 5% of Intel's business. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but what does it mean if Apple does its uh, own chips how does that change i guess the what does it mean is what investors were freaking out about because mm -hmm. there is a potential future where it's not just mac but windows which has experimented with arm based i have windows. a windows on arm uh, laptop and it's not and very good but i have potentially a future where intel <laughs> which holds what like 99 percent of the pc market right now not including tablets is like you know they they might lose hold of that, and that's a scary thought. I mean, they've they've gotten basically nowhere in mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's they have just servers that, and they have PCs. I think this is Intel's fault because, and I think Apple. One of the things Apple's is saying with this is, you guys haven't innovated in years. They yep. can't make a ten nanometer processor yep. to save their life. Qualcomm's doing it. Samsung's doing it. They really, I mean, yeah, there's a seventh, the eighth, the ninth generation Intel chips, but are there is there's not much difference between them. 
I think Apple wants to make wants to go more in this direction. Yeah. I have one of the the That's original a from a few years ago MacBook, which is like super thin and only has one port on he's, it. Which ladies is and gentlemen, he's holding it up with his pinky. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's super light. <laughs> it's, it's, it is. You just it's extremely it. slow. Yeah. 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 Because the Intel chip, the, the best they got. That's a in there, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a computing model, which is increasingly lightweight and mobile. It's a thin client. Yeah. Do you think of it that way? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. yeah, thank you yeah. for the words I was looking for. Yeah. Those are the words I was looking for. Well, well you, you're still it using it, right? Yeah. I mean, you're living yeah. with the slow, but you, if this you could is, be faster, you'd be happy. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the form, but I it's noticeably slow. It's slower than yeah. an iPad. So can I ask, is that the first generation 12-inch uh, MacBook? Yes. I'm not okay, even so sure if I've they've updated that. it I'm, since then. No, they have. Okay. I have the third generation because I just third. replaced yours this year with the, the modern one. It is much, much, much better. It's so good I can use it as my primary machine. So How's the battery life? It, it's it's great. It's fantastic. You know, my uh, problem really is the keyboard. It's not yeah. the uh, it's not the battery life. It's the not keyboard those... is a lot better too. They made it? it so it it gives you. It's not as good as like the old traditional keyboard, but it feels a lot more clicky and gives you more haptic feedback. So, uh, I would really say give that computer another chance because it's drastically better. Yours has an M3. That's all they offered the first generation. Then they started putting i5s and i7s. They're still low power i5s and i7s, but I think they probably are uh, a lot yeah. faster. 14 nanometer. Yeah. Uh, up to 3.6 gigahertz turbo boost. I don't know if they ever get there because of thermal constraints, but it's there if you if you want it. It'll I run Civilization. I mean, you know, that's pretty good. So, <laughs> <laughs> But will they run Crisis? That's the real right. question. Uh, all right. All right. So mm -hmm. Apple, though, I think Apple also, it's not merely that Intel isn't innovating. Mm -hmm. It's that Apple wants to own a their own future right that they uh it was alan k who said if you really care about software you'll make the hardware mm -hmm. they also yeah. want to lessen the load on developers i think they've yeah. been aspiring to get to this place where developers can make on essentially one set of tools and not have to code something with the with a mac architecture in mind and then one with an ios architecture in mind and mm -hmm. they want compilers that'll make one app that can kind of live on in all worlds marzipan yeah but i'm a developer i you have may to wonder push why back i just said marzipan quite a bit <laughs> I, go ahead no, I, and i'm not saying I, one ui but they sure so this they is want the Apple's, language apple the is same. has already said and it, i think we know this that they want to mm -hmm. make ios apps run on mac os oh it's like the yeah. universal but, windows platform right it's basically the same idea they this is yeah. project marzipan yeah. mm -hmm. and uh supposedly we're going to start we'll see it in june at uh, wwdc if they're really serious about this but i think even more than that and i think this is why they want to abandon intel i think ultimately and i have another story that will prove my point apple is in fact moving away from mac os mm -hmm. that apple yeah. wants your next macbook to be running ios yeah or an operating on. system that can handle both I don't know. No, no, no. I think so if, think if that, anything, Mark Zipan is Apple, transitional. Do you think that Apple is basically trying to train people to think of of, of computing as a mobile first fluid experience across like What's a, a phone computer, and a Lisa? Exa that's the, yeah, that's where I'm getting at. <laughs> What's is, a computer? Is Do you think that they're trying to train their user base to think of computing as as simply the, the, the information flow tasks that you do on a phone or a tablet and occasionally on a laptop? I mean, do you think that's where they're going? Well, here's Apple's problem. And Brianna, maybe you can address this. Yeah. Uh, I think Apple's willing to, and we're going to get to this next story about what they're doing with the Mac Pro, but I think mm -hmm. Apple's willing to seed the professional community. They don't like it because it's really important to them, the, mm -hmm. the, the filmmakers, the music makers. Yeah. But one thing, even if they try to save that or lose that, mm -hmm. they can't lose as developers. They mm -hmm. need developers. And right now, development means Mac OS. Mm -hmm. you, I guess, I mean, Apple doesn't want you writing stuff for iOS and Windows. They got they've got, they've got to have mm -hmm. some way to develop for iOS. Right, right now that means macOS, but I here's yeah. if I'm Apple, mm -hmm. my number one priority at this point is getting Xcode to run on iOS to create a, a credible developer platform. Absolutely. I don't know what that looks like. Maybe it looks like a thin client mm -hmm. connected to servers. I, I don't know what that looks like. Leo, I have so much to say about this because it is the absolute worst thing you're ever going to do to try to develop an iOS app and then to try to do the certificate signing on a Mac and then moving them back and forth. It's terrible. But there's so much to unpack in this story with chip architecture and specifically graphics technologies. 
Um, and so, like, let's look at this. Like, Mac OS has long been criticized for its poor implementation of OpenGL. It's absolutely terrible. This is your. This I is can, one of your specialties. This is this is what I do for a living. Before I was doing politics. And OpenGL, OpenGL is so bad on Macintosh. It's so thick. It is inefficient. It is at least twenty five percent worse. It's why games suck. It's why all of that just. And, and the only company really credibly translating mainstream games from x86 over to Mac OS, you know, it's Aspire. And they have the most brilliant people in the entire world that will put it through a translation layer and it will work, but still got a performance hit. So, you know, and everybody who you, plays yeah. games on Macintosh, A, knows Aspire, yeah. and B, knows that's not what you want a PC. You it, want really a PC. True. It's why so many people use boot camp on a Mac, which won't be possible, by the way, if they move over to um, you know, doing an A9 chip or I guess That's an right. A20 chip in the yeah. Mac. That's right. Look, there's a lot to think about here because every single app on Mac will have to be rewritten. And I'm sure they'll have some translation wrapper or something to like ease it over. Like people forget that um, you know, up until they I think did it was this before Snow though. Leopard, they, they did, did this before. They had Rosetta Stone. Carbon, they had Carbon. Rosetta until they, Snow Leopard. And yeah. you could run both of them at the same time. But I think I think in 2018, it's time. I am willing to let Intel go on the Mac because I think we've hoped for this future where Apple was going to fix OpenGL and the graphics technologies enough to make it viable. What about Metal? It, Does Metal solve this? Well, I think this is the advantage, right? Because if you start saying, okay, look, if you develop with Metal, then these are the platforms you can use Metal on. You can do it on Apple TV, you can do it on iOS, you can do it on iPads, and you can do it on the Mac. That is the point where me not using something more universal like OpenGL and saying, okay, I'm going to commit to you know, using Metal as my you know graphical APIs. That's a point where it makes sense. Can you so, use metal on a Mac now? You can, can't you? You can Since theoretically. Sierra, yeah. But but why would I do that? Because the market share on a Mac is so low well, that's compared a, to the market share over on PC. That's another so of problem course entirely. I'm gonna, right, exactly. But it ties to why Apple's strategy is changing. If you look at how much money they make on iOS compared to how much money they make on Mac OS, yeah. uh, any normal company, if it didn't have history, it didn't have maybe it wasn't a little bit Sentimental would just say, "Well, let's get rid of that Mac OS division. That's yeah. not, that's just slowing us down. That's yeah. that's headwind, baby. Get rid of that." But you need, but again, you need it for developers. You do. So if I'm Apple, I am. Is this solvable? Could you? Is it crazy talk to say, dump Mac OS as soon as you get Xcode on iOS? Create some sort of power iOS tool. Maybe it looks like a MacBook. I don't know what it looks like. Maybe it looks like a 30-inch tablet. Maybe it looks like the Surface Studio. I don't know. Yeah, I doubt that. Mm -hmm. uh, but make some power tool for developers that's Mac OS, mm -hmm. and just get rid of. Ma I mean, iOS, and get rid of Mac OS. Is that not? Is that insane? I mean, I hope they don't do it because I love Mac. That's sentiment. So much, that's sentiment. You know? Me too. Right. But that's sentiment. Yeah. That's just pure. That's just pure, you know, uh, nostalgia. I've tried to make an iPad Pro work for a main computer, and I, I bring it with me when I travel and when I do professional speeches. Sometimes I run Keynote from it, but uh, when it comes to like multiple windows, uh, just a Mac has more it's power. The, the email has more power. Yeah, so but, I think but that that's going to change. Move, I, I, I think it's been so. eight yeah. years now. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's what Apple says. A year ago, they brought in uh, five uh, tame Mac journalists, Apple journalists. Uh, no, they weren't all tame. Ina Fried is not tame. But uh, they brought in five journalists, and they did the apology tour. They said, <laughs> we created the Mac Pro, the trash can Mac, the beautiful, beautiful work of art, innovation, can't innovate my ass, said Phil Schiller. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, this is innovation, but oops, we uh, the thermals mean we can't upgrade it. It's got it's a dead end it's product. It's G4 cube. It's yeah. a dead end product. <laughs> yeah. So that was a year ago, and then they said at that time, but we're going to work on it. We're not abandoning the Mac Pro. We're making a new Mac Pro, but it won't be available this year. Matthew Panzerino, one of the five last year, went back mm -hmm. to Apple this week, mm -hmm. and Apple said. Not this year. 
2019. And they showed him they 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 uh, they showed him uh, behind the behind the curtain how they're doing it. They uh, apparently this is very this is so Apple. Uh, they don't you know secrecy is so and I think this hurts Apple. Secrecy is so high at Apple that they don't want to go to the outside world and say, well, how do you work? They brought in they hired people who make music and make video and they put them in little rooms <laughs> and they watched mm -hmm. them. And they uh, and 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 they're doing the Mac Pro line along with the software, the Pro software, so Logic and Final Cut, and those teams are together, and they're trying to develop a hardware software combination for next year that will make pros happy. <laughs> so this is yeah. Apple saying, no, no, we love the Macintosh. I will point out that Apple said, no, no, we love the Apple II, right up to the day that. Macintosh started selling, and then they can, that's it. Bye bye. So Apple's okay. very good. I mean, this is one of their skills. They're very good at abandoning the past, and I think that mm -hmm. that's probably what's going to happen. But but they are saying in 2019, it's going to be a modular pro product, which is what pros want. We want mm -hmm. the cheese grater back. We have a pro workflow team that we are we are inside the building. That is working with the designers of the hardware as well as the designers of the software to make something that professionals will love. That'll be modular, powerful. Does this uh, make everybody happy? I think one of the reasons they did this is because they wanted pros to say, okay, I'll buy the Mac Pro. I can't wait till next year. Right. I think some of yeah. this was just to save the iMac Pro. Yeah. I, but, Leo, don't you see how this is fundamentally at odds with the chip story that we just talked Thank about? Thank you. So, so, so let's, let's break this down, okay? As far as professional things you can do on a Mac, um, let's say you do graphic design, Photoshop. Um, you know, a, a, an iMac, a MacBook Pro really will genuinely meet your needs for that. You don't need more power than that. It's nice to have, but... You know, you're you're in the realm of things you can do. Logic, exact same situation. Like more power is going to help you, but like a lot of parallel processing, it's just not needed there. Um, what other applications are there? Video editing. Again, I think if you look at the current iMac Pro, I I think it's very hard to see even with 4K workflows why you would need more power then. So what is left? 3D is left at that point. 3D work, uh, professional like VFX for movies or game development. And my message to you is if you're moving away from x86, you are throwing that entire market away. It cannot be used. You will not have Nuke on your platform. You will not have Maya. You won't have 3DS Max. Um, Unreal Engine, there's no way they're going to port that over to like an Apple specific chip. So I appreciate like this marketing message that they're bringing out, but these two stories are completely incompatible. Thank it it you. doesn't make sense. That was exactly my reaction to this is this is, yeah. com they're two different, completely different ideas. Well, the, the chip transition is going to happen in phases. It's going to start almost certainly with consumer devices, with the low-end laptops, which are, on a unit basis, by far their largest right, sellers. Right, right. And the iMacs and the Mac Pros could continue to exist for years after the transition begins. Does it, I guess it makes sense if Apple thinks there's two... Apple has two goals. One is we got to keep developers making stuff. And I don't think it's games, by the way, Brianna, but we just yeah, got to keep yeah. people writing stuff for iOS. Apps. A apps. And then oh, two, we, for sentimental reasons, but also somewhat practical reasons, want creative professionals to still love Macs. They did for mm -hmm. years, right? That, that, that relationship's only started going south a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. We want them to still love Macintosh because it adds cachet to the platform. It makes it a hip platform. I mean, there's lots of, I don't know, kind of soft reasons that you might want to keep that market. Mm -hmm. So what if they, made, they did make a Mac Pro that was just completely a a dead end in the business model, right? It's just kind of, we're just keep making that out there because there's a thousand people that will buy it and then put everything else into iOS. But they keep the Mac alive just because... Security updates. Yeah. And I mean, that, what have they been doing for the last like four or five years? They haven't the been Mac? doing much. Look at the Mac Mini. I own a 2013 trash can, beautiful <laughs> cylinder. Actually, I don't. I gave it to Nathan. 
Nathan. <laughs> That's right. I gave my yeah. Mac Pro to Nathan Oliver as Giles, who probably he made has out no, well on yeah. that. Yeah, he probably has no use for it either. But uh, it was a doorstop. That's why I gave mm -hmm. it to him. It's a very high priced doorstop. Um, that hadn't been updated. If you go to the page, it's the same Mac Pro I bought in 2013. That's a, that's yeah. unconscionable. Yeah. That's now actions speak louder than words in that case. Yeah. You could say, "Oh, we got these people in this. Look at the, all the people, and they're working hard to make a new Mac Pro." Mm -hmm. But where's the Mac Mini? Where? Uh, what's happening with the Mac Pro? Why are your laptops getting more and more like iOS devices? Right? Uh, they don't. They say we're never going to do touch on a Mac laptop, but the market wants touch. Just yeah. ask Microsoft. Yeah. The market yeah. wants touch. This 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 should be an iPad. This mm -hmm. this Surface I Studio. Agree. This shouldn't be a oh, Windows so device. Nice. Yeah. And I the way I use it, the way I I want to use it is it would work perfectly with an iPad for telestrating, mm -hmm. zooming in, doing the kind of stuff. Uh, so Microsoft has this phrase they like to bring up called the five generation workplace where what they point out is that as of right now, we have five distinct technological co cohorts in the workplace from people in the early 20s all the way up to people in their 60s and 70s. And the argument is that- <laughs> I'm, that I'm that guy in the 60s and 70s. But the argument- Let me tell you something, that's a really depressing cohort. <laughs> but the <laughs> argument is that you- <laughs> But the argument is that the technology that enters the workplace is the technology that people have been using in schools. They think and that us 60-year-olds want to use- And that people use, are uh, cultured to. Windows. And yeah. this is why when you take I a look guess. at office suites and things like that, they now offer a tremendous amount of collaboration because this is what people have been using through university- um, they've been using to manage their social life, to manage information flow, to manage files, things like that. And the same thing goes for computer hardware. If you are a young adult who has been, who has grown up on tablets right. and phones you and things want, like that. You don't want to You seen Well, there should be, in your mind, why would you not want a computing experience where you can basically do everything you need to do that you can do on, right. a, on a mobile device? That's what you grew up with. Yeah. And frankly, that's the future, isn't it? Yeah. Well, so, I'd argue that the, and this is a whole different topic, but, you know, the future is, is less keyboard because you're talking earlier about keyboards. And I kept thinking, that's going to be something that I don't think matters to users in 15 see years. That, or oh, matters let's to, argue you know, about that yeah, because yeah. I find, boy, oh boy. <laughs> Somebody in the studio just went, oh. So. I, I mean, <laughs> really? Do you think, uh, yeah. I mean, you think we won't be, t how are you going to write your articles? Yeah. Voice. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, Mark, you're not writing your articles with speaking? No, you're, I you're mean a young person. Yeah. Uh, Did you I wait a minute? Now in true, college yeah. and high school, you didn't yeah. have yeah. tablets yet. Yeah. You're not no that tablets. Young. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No tablets. I mean, you're also assuming you're also assuming because you talked about writing articles and prose and things like that, but we're also looking at media channels that are becoming increasingly more image or video or audio based you know too. What's funny, so that's a completely though, different way of presenting. Maybe content. they're outliers, but I have a twenty six yeah. year old and a twenty three year old and they I mm -hmm. keep trying to give them an iPad. Yeah. yeah. They don't want it. <laughs> yeah. Abby, who's 26, uses a Chromebook. And Chromebooks Henry... are huge oh. in daughter, schools right now. Really? My daughter, who yeah. is seven, is on a Chromebook. And, um, See, I think you need yeah. a keyboard. I don't think you. I no, don't think typing is going to go away she, that quickly. No, watch, watching her maneuver, because you know she's just learning a little bit of keyboarding now, but again, she's seven, she's first grade. And for her... Um, it's all touch. It's touch, or it's arrow keys. And... Mm. Bearing in mind, this is a kid who's just learning how to read it and just reading now. So yeah. there's a lot of work for keyboarding, and I don't think they get into it until after they learn cursive in my, my kid's hippie school, which is fine. Why okay. do but, they? Okay. Um, but the point, Worse but the point than is, keeping keyboards around, keeping cursive around. No, there's actually <laughs> there are actually studies that show that writing things out and using cursive is a way to help information processing and retention. And it's actually um, underscoring some of the so mind-body connection schools and retaining information. Really? Some schools do. So we pulled up this do. research for the uh, for the Apple uh, education yeah. event in Chicago, the mm -hmm. market, uh, market breakdown in American mm -hmm. schools, 60% uh, Android or Chromebook. Yeah. Android? Wow. No, and if you have Google, like Google software, no, Google 60%. It. 60%. It's Windows, 22%. Yeah. Apple, 17%. That's why Apple yeah. had an education event, yeah. but their entire education event was, was basically, we love yeah. education, now Please buy more buy iPads. iPads. Yeah. 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 But the thing, yeah. So but to get back to the Google thing, one of the things that I've noticed with my nephews are teenagers, my niece is now in college, they grew up on Google apps and that's what they use in school. Their teacher throw, threw, used to throw the assignments into a Google Doc it was all collaborative. You could see the teacher's notes. You could see their classmates' notes. They did all their group projects that way. And they see no reason to switch to Microsoft in the workplace. 
because they're like, I already know how to do this. I already have workflow that works for me. You know, it's well, kind Lisa, of I have to, Lisa, I have to say this. I've talked to so many school districts yeah. because they're underfunded. Right. That's no why money. they do it. You yeah. know, it's true. But yeah. I don't want, it's and free. I would lobby yeah. you, Christina, I mean, uh, Brianna, if you were uh, our uh, Congress, member of Congress, I would lobby you mm -hmm. and say, we we really uh, don't want a closed proprietary solution in yeah. our schools. Sure, schools should yeah. not be investing in a proprietary Apple ecosystem. Yeah. They should be investing in an open ecosystem. Uh, Google's much more open, mm -hmm. but it, it, I I think that's really important. I think s public schools. I, I don't I don't care what private schools do, but public <laughs> schools should support open. Yeah. Shouldn't I they? Could, I think I have so much to say about this. I think government as a whole should always be developing free and open source yes. software by default, yes. always. Yes. Because we're the taxpayers, we're paying for it. Mm -hmm. If someone can take that code and reuse it, great. Thank in addition, you. better security. You know, it's open. We can look at it for holes. We can find out what the problems are. What I see going on in school districts is so unconscionable right now. Thank it you. is so wasteful because every single school district will have some vendor that they will have to pay to bring in some specialized software for their database and their, talk. you know, yeah. all of it is just a swindle. It's a swindle. What I want to do is to develop, like, open I want to have like solutions. a billion dollar free yeah. and open source system yes. for the basic stuff schools and hospitals, other like civic infrastructures do, like databases for student with rock solid cybersecurity, uh, class collaboration stuff. There's no way we can't program this and we can create millions and millions of dollars worth of jobs if we do this. So I think we need a complete paradigm shift. I love Microsoft. I think they're probably one of the better companies in tech today, but I do think it's not a good deal for the public schools to continually get locked into these contracts with Windows. Or Mac or any yeah. other proprietary Absolutely. solution. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, let's take a break. I hope you're not. I want to talk more about Apple. We got lots more to talk about. We've got a great panel. Brianna Wu is here. Mm -hmm. You just heard a little bit of her stump speech, candidate for U.S. Congress in the <laughs> Massachusetts Eighth. Brianna Wu, 2018.com, which, as we speak, is being DDoSed. That's true. Sorry. Yep, it sucks. <laughs> uh, what the hell? You think it's Russians? I don't. So the alt right has found a lot of ways to. They don't uh, like you, do they? Mess, they're, we're not friends. We're not, not friends. friends. They've actually gone and in different countries filed claims against our domain. So yeah. I'm trying to talk to people in French, getting control Ugh. of my own domains back. Like Ugh. it has just been a nightmare. They're a nightmare. They're it. really bad yeah. people. I don't. I don't know where these people came from. Yeah. But they have. There's. They have no moral compass at all. And yeah. it's, it, it, is there a nexus? There's a nexus between this and Gamergate. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, the same sure. people. Mm -hmm. Same so, people. Yeah. Something wrong with those people. I wish I knew what it was. I wish we could fix them. <laughs> You're broken. Yeah. Um, anyway, thank you, Brianna. I kind of want a ringtone <laughs> where you just say, You're broken. You're broken. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I need a hug. <laughs> well, but fortunately, we have people who are so brave. I just want to give you credit. I mean, you're so brave. In your shoes, I would just have disappeared from the face of the earth. I would be. Somewhere no one could find me. But you <laughs> instead went the opposite direction. You went somewhere yeah. everybody could find you. And gosh darn it, I, uh, I applaud you. You're, that's Talk about civic duty and, and serving. That is a big deal. Thank we you. We really, really need people to understand technology making policy. It has never been more important. I, I think like I really feel like technologists have a – like patriotism <sighs> is something – it's like a – it's not a word you can use sincerely, but I really I believe use it. this. I use if it you, sincerely yeah. now. If you love this country and you're a technologist, I think you need to think about your civic duty and consider serving. Yes. I, I genuinely believe I that. I couldn't agree more. And women, look at all. There are more women now running for Congress than men. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, this is this is such a sea change. And it's because mm -hmm. I think we want we love this country and we want to stand up in this country and we want to I make agree. it right. Uh, so thank you, Brianna, for being so brave. Wow. Yep. Uh, Lisa Schmeiser is also brave for other reasons. She says <laughs> she's writes oh, about Windows. That's brave. <laughs> IT pro today. No. <laughs> Editor there. No, I'm teasing you. But aren't you, isn't your heart with a Mac? Let's tell the truth. Uh, so I will say as a user, yeah. I'm locked yeah. into the Apple ecosystem, yeah. have been for quite some yeah, you're time. You're wearing an Apple watch, you're using a Mac. I am, it's true. You're and even drinking that new... 
weird Coke light. You know, I almost, I almost, <laughs> I almost never um, drink stuff with aspartame in it. But no, this I, is I stevia. To... This oh, is, this is like even better. This then, is the new. Then my ban on aspartame continues. Um, well, it might have, a, it might have some aspartame. No, right? it, the, but to get back to the Microsoft <laughs> question, I yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, aspartame! <laughs> My brain, it's melting. Um, I think one, I think Microsoft as a company is one of the most interesting stories over the past few years. I completely with, agree. In fact, yeah. we're going to talk about yeah. the demotion, the, the demotion of Windows in just a second. The the demotion has been going on for quite some time, and we'll talk about it more. Yeah. But but yeah, it's I much think the same. So. in a way, it's very similar to this Apple conversation. Yeah. Companies are these mainline companies are really dealing with. Well, we're at an a, inflection point. A huge change in the world. We're at an inflection yeah. point where you think about it through the 70s and 80s. What we did is we normalized tech in the workplace, and we normalized the idea of automation as being a component of people's jobs and redirecting human energies compared yeah. to things that you could have a computer do. We've hit the the end stage of that development and all of these companies are now writing what they think the next stage looks like. Yeah. Apple has one particular vision, Microsoft has a particular vision, IBM has a particular vision, and it's interesting to see how companies are um, moving their internal resources into place and then positioning their products towards their existing customers and the customers they hope to attract. I'm kind of wind with Mark Millian here though on this, that these companies are right to think that at any moment they could be displaced. Yeah. That, that that's one of the natures of technology. Mm -hmm. And the Andy Grove always said, only the paranoid survive, who's yeah. the CEO of Intel. Intel could have used a little more paranoia. Yeah. I just want to say, competition is good, right? That's for sure. Mark Millian's here. He's from <laughs> Bloomberg. He writes about all this stuff. He's technology editor there, at Mark Millian on Twitter. I don't want to make you hungry. Mm. I show you what I made last night. Oh, this is so good. <gasps> this is my Blue Apron. I know you like Blue Apron. I hear, I hear, I hear uh, Simone Leo, raving. Leo, look at this. This is what I'm making this oh, week. Oh, look. Right here. Look yes, absolutely. <laughs> blue Apron. I love Blue Apron. We love yes. it. So uh, Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient recipe delivery service in the country. You get a Blue Apron box. We get ours once a week with three meals in it, so three different meals for a family. Uh, the I've never seen better produce, vegetables, and meats. They, I, they have some magic that really has made them the king here, where everything is beautiful and perfect. Mm -hmm. Of course, if it's not, they'll make it good. But it always is. And they use ingredients that are unique and fabulous. Here's how it works. You're, you're going to go to the Blue I may have my mouth's watering. You're going to go to the Blue Aprons site every week, 12 new recipes. Each of them can be cooked in under 45 minutes. Depending on your subscription, you pick two, three, or four recipes based on what fits your schedule. Non-GMO ingredients, meat with no added hormones. They're really working on a sustainable food system. They, it does, so this is what we made uh, the other night. This is seared steaks with lemon, parmesan, kale, and roasted potatoes. We made the steaks because uh, our 15-year-old really, he, he doesn't like... Blue Apron has some wonderful exotic Asian-inspired meals. There's all sorts of really interesting meals. But he's pretty basic. So we made the steak. He ate the steak and the uh, delicious roasted potatoes. But we made, I got the, this kale recipe blew oh, me away. Yes. I'm going to make this again and again and again. There's a, I had that too, Leo. It was so good. Isn't it, it was good so with good. a little fresh cream and oh. some lemon? Oh, it's amazing. Oh, and a little garlic. I've never had better kale in my life. So that's what happens with Blue Apron. You get this meal. So you make this meal and you serve it and the house smells great. If you can get the kids to help, it turns them on to the idea that cooking a meal is better than going to fast food. So that's really a win. But then also, you always have exactly the right ingredients, not, not too much, not too little. So there's never any waste. If you need a clove of garlic, you get a clove of garlic. If you need a little bit of soy sauce, you get a little bit of soy sauce. It's always just the right amount. And actually, that makes it a little easier to cook, too, because you know mm -hmm. if at the end of the recipe you haven't used it all, you missed something. Um, I This blew me away, and, I, and that's what happens is, so you make the meal, you eat the meal, but then every time I get a new ingredient new idea, a new way of cooking that I will make again and again and again. Now, Blue Apron doesn't mm -hmm. repeat these recipe items, these menu items more than once a year. So you're going to see a whole bunch of different stuff, but you will. this will add to your repertoire. That kale I will be making again and again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have vegetarian meals. Here's what's on the menu this week. How about seared salmon and lemon labna? I don't even know what that is with frika. I don't know what that is. Zucchini and dates. Sounds good, though. That's the thing is, next time I'll know, all right? Um, what else do we have there? Love, love miso sweet potato donburi. Doesn't that look good? So yes. like I said, they some of it's very exotic. Some of it's 
you know, meat and potatoes. You get to choose what you want. Incredible ingredients, chef designed recipes, exactly the amount you need. Blue Apron lets you see that what the power of food can do. This is about bringing, I, t I always think of making a meal for my family as making, as, as giving them love. And yeah. when they sit down and eat that meal that you made with your hands, there is nothing better. Nothing better. Get $30 off your first delivery. Better. I, there's one thing better, getting them to cook it for you. Blue Apron, <laughs> and they can, by the way. Blue Apron, it's a great way to get a kid cooking. Blueapron.com slash twit. Skip the fast food, skip the microwave oven, use Blue Apron this week. Blue Apron's treating our listeners to $30 off your first order and free shipping. All you have to do is go to blueapron.com slash twit. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off with free shipping. Blueapron.com slash twit. We love Blue Apron. It's a better way to cook. Blue Can I say one more thing here, Leo? They did two things this year that I love with it. So the first thing is you can move to a family plan with it. So something, because it's harder for me personally campaigning to cook all the time, I've moved to the family plan where they give you a set of four. So then if you're cooking, it's not just one meal for you and your husband. Uh, like you can have leftovers to eat later. And I love that. And the other thing is if you're, you go to the app and you find out, okay, I like this. I want this this week. If like you see three or four things and you love them all, you can click them all and have them delivered. If you only see one thing, you just click that one thing. Or if you're going on vacation or you're going to be off town, you just click uh, like skip that week. Yep. So they have gotten so much better this year at working through these like small problems with the service. And it is, it is just amazing today. I really love it. I'm yeah. guessing that they're probably a sponsor of Rocket. They are, they are, but um, they. I don't think they're sponsoring us this year. I oh. just, I use them because I love them. We love so. them. Yep, me too. Yeah. And if you're not listening to Rocket, Brianna and uh, Christina Warren and Simone de Rochefort, who's the only person who's not been on Twitter of that, of that <laughs> and she does the best Blue Apron ads that make me so hungry. She's, uh, She's amazing. Simone has, she has so much talent. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great geek conversation from Relay.fm Rocket. That's uh, Brianna Wu's fabulous podcast. You gave, you helped me do my ad. I'll help you plug your fabulous <laughs> I genuinely love it. Just like you. I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, so. right. It's yeah. nice to have advertisers you love. That's kind of our, our model, actually. Uh, we had fun this week on uh, Twitter, and we have a little mini movie. Karsten, can you... Uh, can you roll the film? Previously on Twit. I'm guessing from the name Quake Alert 2 that this is not your first app. So what's oh, yeah. new? What's different between this and your first Quake Alert? It's better. Okay, oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's Oh, bravo. It, it's, it's new and improved. <laughs> know how. So I thought today what we might want to do is give our audience some basic knowledge, some from soup to nuts, bare bones, one-on-one information about how to start making 3D objects that can be printed <gasps> and here for free. Megan, what's your thing doing? Uh, my heart is flying. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Megan has found rotation, which we were going to get to. Okay. This week in Google. I so, actually so, question well, your support you think for, for every Facebook. Every one of the two billion people who are on Facebook, that they are just a thrust into the faces of Nazis every day. I think they don't know what they're giving up to Facebook. How and elitist. How elitist. Did they tell you they were scanning your messages? Oh, we, I just Did they I'm tell you they were collecting your Android call history? When they get caught, they apologize, and then they go right ahead and do it. This is your brain. This is your brain on Twit. Any questions? I shouldn't have been so mad at Jeff. Hold on. I'm, I'm almost to the final boss. <laughs> <laughs> You've reached the, the final boss. Yeah. Sam Mashkovich well, I mean, is always... The compliment I can pay my good friend. <laughs> always great for game. We were talking before the, uh, before the show about Ready Player One. You've seen it, Brianna. These two haven't. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the vision of VR in Ready Player One. Mm -hmm. But, of course, the whole point of Ready Player One is the whole world has gone to hell. And yeah. so... Every, the only way, and nobody can afford to go on vacation, mm -hmm. so the only way anybody has any fun is in, <laughs> it's in a virtual yeah. oasis. But uh, maybe we're headed that way, but they do have it down, and especially yeah. in the movie. you got to see the movie. They've got a... And we actually had that on the new screensavers. Mm -hmm. They've got one of those treadmills that goes in any, an omnidirectional mm -hmm. treadmill. Oh, wow. oh, my God. Those exist. Oh, yeah. They don't show this in the movie, but we I found out, because Jason Howell did it on the new screensavers, I, you can go up to seven miles an hour, you can run. If you can run seven miles an hour, I can. I can, yeah. <laughs> seven miles an hour. But 
I, he said, but it sounds like a freight train because it, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's all the rollers and the motors mm -hmm. and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a good movie. I, I, I highly, you recommend it, right, Brianna? Am oh, I, absolutely. Yeah. They, um, you know, I was, it got a bit of backlash from some of the leftist community. I can say, go see the movie, put Why? all the criticism aside. It's, the book is not really the best written women you're ever going to. Oh, the book encounter. is not the best writing. Right. Book is no. now yes. Ernest Klein. Yes. I love you, and I'm and yeah. but but I mean, the, it, literally, I'm starting to count how many people in the book have infectious grins. It's yeah. not, it's actually <laughs> I'm starting to get a little queasy. It's an epidemic. The grins are infectious. Infectious grins are everywhere. Yeah. It's one of those books where there's a lot of that. Sorry. It's not. It's not. You know, but. On the other hand, this, the ideas, this, it, that's what we read science it's fiction great. for, is the ideas. I've read that book like 20 times. It's really? Great. Oh, all right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I started I really it 20 it. times, and the infectious grin <laughs> stopped me. It would <laughs> be I'm, interesting to see a hyperlinked version where you linked all the cultural reference. There's a ton of it. What's <laughs> it interesting would. is I think that's, Spielberg that would be a great use of hypertext. branched it, it out a little bit, because it was yeah. in the 80s in the book, right? Spielberg mm -hmm. has yeah. more yeah. stuff from other eras. Yep. Um, I was really hoping that Spielberg would throw in some Jaws references. I was really uh, hoping. That's a little self-owning. Why not, though? <laughs> he is, I mean, Spielberg was one of the yeah. great directors of the 80s, right? Yeah, I mean, it's true. who yeah. better direct this movie than the... Than, I know. did read something about how he had pledged not to put any uh, of his own references in the yeah. movie. There's and some then, Kubrick uh, in there. There's supposedly, of, his, yeah. uh, the people around him on the set were like, no, you got to put uh, yeah. Back to the Future. And Oh, that's yeah. right. So mm -hmm. Back to the Future's yeah. in there, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there is a little bit of that. He I didn't do have direct to say, it, though. He's, he's produced, produced it. it. Yeah. yeah. I, I have two criticisms in the movie. As a game developer, I don't understand how anyone could ship a game of that quality, keeping it secret and not having play testers. That's just absolutely Good impossible. Point. But the, the other thing is they never explain the, the core reason you can't have player one, uh, Ray Player One in real life right now is the disconnect between your inner ear right. and what your eyes see. So if you've yeah. ever experienced VR, you have to have a teleport mechanic to move around because if it's just you running down a It'll hallway, throw up. your eyes, yeah, it makes you nauseous because you're, Eyes think you're moving right. forward, and your ear is telling you you're standing still. They they know they kind of just like you know wish that away in the book. But uh, I I would love for us to figure out how to solve that because then we can have that awesome universe. It would yeah, be great. In, in the book, the uh, and I think in the movie too, the visor is shooting lasers into your retina, so it's not yep. you're not yep. looking at screens. Yep. What they leave out now, maybe I'm missing this in the mm -hmm. book. Maybe Lisa, you, you can tell me or Brianna. They talk about how the Oasis, which is this mm -hmm. virtual reality game, was so popular because it was free. It was a quarter. You paid a quarter, yep. yeah. which is cute because it's like the video game machines and the Ready Player One. There's all these throwbacks to video game machines. What they don't mention is, oh, and by the way, you need a laser retina visor <laughs> mm -hmm. and haptic feedback gloves. They never mention mm -hmm. how, yeah. how you fund those. That's going to cost like 500 bucks at least. Yeah. Well, in the in the book, they do have him scavenging for tech too. Yeah, yeah. but to, 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 but in order to get in the yeah. oasis, you have to have at least that minimal yeah. hardware. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. say the game is free. They don't. What are they yeah. giving them? Free visors? And uh, I don't understand that part. Anyway, that's. I don't remember. Well, I don't want to be that guy. I remember the scavenging for tech, which helps him bankroll right. his habit. Right. And so he also you can all make, schools have moved online, or at least that's good how schools that's have right. That's how he got it. Which is how he got it. so yeah. yeah so right. many students that's get right. it for free. It was the school Although provided the, basic Oasis gear. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, and a basic Oasis access, and then he had that's to right. scrounge for the rest of it. The chat room's telling me that too. Yeah. But what if you weren't a student? I mean, what if the vast majority of people who weren't students? How do they get it? I think so well. um, I think one of the unspoken they they don't get into like civic policy in this world no. <laughs> the slightest no. but I think one of the core assumptions is that somebody who is as economically disadvantaged as your protagonist has basic schooling then there's been some sort of nationwide rollout right. where it's distributed the same it way must that be. you can distribute the government the must order. there must be basic income because yeah, yeah a lot of do. these people don't seem to be working yeah yeah <laughs> at all. Yeah. Lisa, I have to fact check you on one thing. They do get into civic policy by say by putting Will Wheaton and Cory Doctorow in charge of all internet technology. <laughs> that is actually a line in that's the in the book. So, that's I in the book. I haven't gotten to that part uh, yet. No. Yes. <laughs> Ernest Klein, who wrote the book, was a former editor at Boing Boing. So yeah. it's a little. Oh, 
tip of the hat to his old buddies. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm go. I'm thrilled that Ernest has done so well. Mm -hmm. I mean, and yeah. I and I think if you want to see a great movie, mm -hmm. that's going to be the summer film. I maybe oh I don't know maybe Infinity War. I don't know. We got some good Ooh. movies. Coming. Yeah. No. Oh, well, let's see. Infinity War comes out in a couple weeks. Yep. Um, don't we have a new um, Ant Man coming out this summer too? Yes, there's yes. a new Ant Man. Yeah. Is that are you like into Ant Man? I really liked the first one. <laughs> I did. I did. I better, I better go back. I'm not up on the Ant Man canon. So I better watch the first Ant Man. Please, I saw please don't the, make me explain the difference between Hank Pym and Scott Lang. It's a <laughs> very strange I saw the trailer for the new Ant Man and it is it is I, yeah. I, I was what's going on? Yeah. Lisa had a whisper in my ear, my wife, mm -hmm. not you. Had a whisper in my ear. The transitive it's, property it's of Lisa's were everywhere. <laughs> all all Lisa's whispered in my ear. <laughs> It's Ant-Man. I yeah. said, is he small? Is he yeah. big? What's going on? In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, there is something called Pym Particles, which warp the laws of physics and allow you to go into this subatomic spaces between atoms themselves. And the Pym Particles allow you to expand or contract. Uh, <laughs> All right, Leah, you've got to see this. You got, yeah. I'm so is excited Frank about Mr. Infinity Ant -Man? War. Oh. Oh, oh, you've got the gauntlet. Oh my gosh. I do. <laughs> what the hell? Okay, so for those of yeah. you just listening, Branna's wearing a bronzed plastic glove that is the size of like yeah. five Brianna's. And it, <laughs> oh, she just broke it. And uh, no, it's got gems on it. What's it for? <laughs> What's that for? I think it's for just looking awesome and walking <laughs> around. I want to shoot like a video of me driving like my Porsche and mm -hmm. like shifting the gears with this Infinity Gauntlet. This is so <laughs> awesome. What's the sound coming out of that? Is that it? So when you you can push this button, <laughs> it's kind of like a Simon <laughs> Says on yeah. the knuckles. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> Please, God, let us uh, the world. I'm an adult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we <laughs> talked uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, the really great science fiction uh, mm -hmm. book, The Three-Body Problem. Oh, I haven't read and that. how, who was it? Is it Amazon? I think Amazon spent a billion dollars mm -hmm. just for the rights. Not wow. for the production. Just for the rights to make this trilogy. It's a mm -hmm. Chinese uh, science fiction classic. It's really good. Okay, the, the money's going up a lot. After battling Netflix for the rights to bring The Lord of the Rings to the small screen, Amazon has paid $250 million for the right to make a TV series. They expect to spend more than a billion dollars, five-season commitment. It's not like we haven't seen The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big criticism. Of this. this has already been done recently and well. Yeah, very well. Didn't um, we talk about this on a previous episode where we're like, what stories could you possibly tell at this point? Oh, maybe we did. Yeah, because I remember when this deal was first announced, I was on, and I think we got distracted talking about whether this is going to be a show all ends all the time or... Well, they uh, you're yeah. right, because in yeah. November they made the deal for yeah. it. Okay, so I'm not... Uh, this is, I guess, an article from The Hollywood Reporter inside mm -hmm. yeah. the deal that came out this week. Um, going into some of the budget the budget the a mm -hmm. billion dollars wow. to make it but this what this does say that is absolutely uh, a hot mm -hmm. topic uh, is the change in television and the, and the shift in power to Netflix and Amazon mm -hmm. yeah. away from the traditional yeah. the, you don't even hear ABC, NBC and CBS talking about deals like this anymore they're not even yeah. in the mm -hmm. game they're busy making real, the Bachelor 15 and stuff this is and it's and and Apple has also really mm -hmm. stepped into this battle and they're spending a yep. billion dollars. This is really interesting. Apple's been completely unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. I mean, the shows yeah. are really bad. <laughs> and, well, and Amazon has had mixed success. I mean, this is an irrational deal. You to think it is business to five <laughs> seasons before seeing a pilot is just insane. Yeah. I'm not sure that's ever been done. Quarter of a billion dollars goes to the publisher and, of course, the Tolkien estate. Uh, Amazon has to be in production within two years, according to the deal. So they don't have to, they have no time to waste. Casting, producers, visual effects, production, of course, north of a billion dollars. Uh, wow. Uh, according to uh, the insiders, um, the chief architect of the deal said, this is the most complicated deal I've ever seen. I've ever seen. 
Wow. And it just shows you, I think so what it shows like you. So it's basically like a white collar employment act. Yeah. No, I think it shows you how desperate these companies are, that mm -hmm. they really, for some reason, I'm not sure why, why does Amazon think this is worth it? They're not even yeah. in the business of making TV shows, or are they? They are. Oh, I guess they are. Excellent. Selling subscriptions with awesome those video on Amazon. Service. So, okay, so let me, so let's walk this back. <laughs> nice so, Mark, you're saying city. that the the reason they do this is because they it sells Amazon Prime subscriptions. Yeah, ninety nine bucks a year gets you into the Amazon world. I think they've also thought about decoupling video from Prime as well. So that and they're having six. They're one of the most successful behind Netflix. I mean, Apple is nowhere close. Yeah. So, Amazon's did they make enough part. money on Prime subscriptions to justify a billion dollar TV series? I, their whole model is get people into the Amazon world. And if they can sell you a Prime subscription, that might mm -hmm. get you to use your Prime credit card at Whole Foods and get mm -hmm. you to buy wow. on Amazon, uh, buy your goods on now Amazon. Now, that's antitrust. Mm -hmm. They're taking their monopoly, well, right? Trump's, and Trump's making the argument. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. The president, now some of this seems to be the president just doesn't like Jeff Bezos and the Washington Post. <laughs> it's a big part of it. But, but, uh, Wait, but Bezos but, owns the Post privately, though. The Post right. is not part of Amazon. There was an I mean, article in the, the Post. Fact that if you're an oh, here's your Prime article, Mark subscriber, article. you get a much cheaper rate well, on your true. Washington Post sub subscription. It's One of the things cheaper. that's completely spurious is yeah. Trump saying that the U.S. Postal Service is going bankrupt because of Amazon. It's quite yeah. the opposite. Yeah. The U.S. Postal yeah. Service is driving a truck to every house anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. The fact that Amazon spends billions putting yeah. packages in that truck is really incremental income. That's good. Pa yeah, package <laughs> revenue is the only growth area at the yeah. post office right now, yeah. and that's yeah. being driven by Amazon. And yeah. The post office has said uh, mm -hmm. that we make they, money. Make, they make money from yeah. the Amazon deal, and that e-commerce helps power the entire mm -hmm. rest of the, of the postal service to offer their required, uh, you know, their requisite universal service. Mm -hmm. Take away the $5 mail. billion dollars Amazon gives them to del del deliver packages. You still have to go to every house in, every, in, yeah. in the country every single day I've whether a, there's a package in there or not i've been on a mail boat that delivers mail up to rural towns in oregon where the roads are so bad you can't drive in and so what they do every day is there's a boat that stops at a package and mail depot loads up the boat and then the boat stops and people come down to the boat dock and pick up their mail i would i would submit also so it's just it, the point is not everybody lives on an easy right. to get to street it's expensive to deliver mail in this country i would submit yeah. that the u.s postal service i know it's yeah. kind of trying to be run like a business yeah is a vital service of the u.s government mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. to say it has to make a profit's kind of nuts mm -hmm. and it's not even close to making profit no, but it's but of the, course is the u.s army making a profit <laughs> it's part of what you do as a government mm -hmm. is get yeah. the mail delivered there I is mean, an argument to be made that, that they're not charging Amazon the mm -hmm. rates that a business could mm -hmm. be charging Amazon, which is yeah. why they got that deal. So I think that's, that's even though Trump had many flawed statements in, in his argument there, like some they could potentially be charging Amazon. Also, uh, Trump accused Amazon of not collecting taxes. Of course, Amazon does collect sales taxes, but there is also some merit there because Amazon yeah. does not collect sales taxes on third-party sellers mm -hmm. on Amazon. That's left to the yeah. third-party sellers, yeah. right? So yeah. there's some merit to that too. We're being fair. Mm -hmm. We're being fair here. So uh, I have to say, like I, I personally am not into Lord of the Rings primarily because there are no women in this universe. In wait a minute. There's way. Ariel the Fairy Queen. There, there are a few, and they added a few for the Peter Jackson Jackson adaptation. They did, didn't but, they? Yeah. But yeah. it's, yeah. but it's, but it's, no, it's, it's primarily it's a bunch a of guys. It's a story about men. Yeah. Yeah. A bunch of guys with hairy feet so, walking so, around. So, so and that's it. Yeah. I personally am not that big a fan of it, but I think like if you look at the really big uh, you know, networks developing the best television right now, Netflix has by far the best programming, right? Uh, HBO's Westworld. I would argue Showtime has Homeland and Billions, which are both excellent. I'm looking forward to seeing oh, them after billions. I get off of here. Billions this season is the best season yet. It's it's looking really good. Really good. And but. As far as Amazon, what do they have on that? I personally really like Bosch. I think that is an excellent show. And I like that they got 24 uh, as an exclusive show on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But there's not really anything over there that really makes me go, this is something I really must have on my device. So I think them aggress aggressively investing in a tentpole property 
it makes a lot of sense to me personally. So I think this is, I think it's exactly as you said, Mark. I think this is getting people involved in their video ecosystem. I'm going to give uh, Jeff Bezos a little business tip. Because I think you could use it, Jeff. You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> could be even more of the richest person <laughs> on it. It could be the twice <laughs> the richest. Coming from one of the poorest guys, I'll tell the richest guy. Uh, what Apple did, you're right, Apple had a, made a horrible mess of it with uh, the planet of the apps. Yeah. Carpool karaoke, a little better, but still. Mm -hmm. But what Apple did, what they realized is there is a secret to Hollywood success. There are, just as there are in the gaming industry, just as there are in the writing trade, there mm -hmm. are superstars in television production and yeah. movie production. And Apple went and they found marquee people, people who, two executives who worked at Sony, who had a real track record. And I, I would submit that Apple's going to turn it around given what they've acquired. They've really put some good deals together. And I think that's clearly what Netflix has and what Amazon's lacking is the right, I hate to say this, the right executives. So I would actually argue that another component, we're talking a lot about the shows that they're launching now, but... Um, I think another reason people binge on these streaming services is they get to catch up on shows they haven't seen the first time. That's where Netflix can really win. Or they get, yeah. well, Amazon Prime, for example, I never saw the series Brotherhood on Showtime when it aired. Oh. I didn't have Showtime in the early 80s, right. but Netflix has all three, not Netflix, Amazon Prime has all three seasons. I mainlined it over a weekend when I had a flu. Um, <laughs> and I now have, well, I now have like this whole watch list on Chicken Amazon to go with soul. my whole watch list on Netflix yeah. of, of series that I don't have time to watch during say a school year, but can watch during right. the summer. Um, I feel like Netflix is better for that than Amazon though, it don't you? It depends. Um, I, I hate thinking about having to get a Hulu subscription, but I think that's where you Hulu have to get a lot of Fox real. and FX yeah. ones. Yeah. But this is um, for all of the buzzy news shows. I think you. what I'd love to see is a breakout of viewing patterns with how how much, how many hours are sunk into the new content as it comes out in binge watching, say, season two of Jessica Jones? And how many hours are people spending rewatching the entire series run of Friends? I think the numbers I've seen from yeah. Netflix are uh -huh. that these marquee tentpole series mm -hmm. make money right up front. Yeah. That they yeah. generate new subscriptions to such a great extent mm -hmm. that they can even see it. That the yeah. day these launch, boom, the subscriptions go up. That yeah. they know it works. Yeah. And I would guess Amazon is probably doing some a yeah. similar calculus. Although it's not as clean with Amazon because Amazon Prime has other reasons you might subscribe yeah. than Jessica Jones. What I'd also like to know is with the Amazon Prime videos is what what is the breakdown of watching original content versus repurposed content? But no, see, but, and, here's the beauty of this. They know. Well, and then, <laughs> they and then, know, exactly. And then, and then the follow-on question is, is how are they going to use that data to customize your recommendations or to slice and dice you into this specific is where, psychographics? This is why the networks are out of the game. Because the networks <laughs> yeah, have yep. no idea, right? They yep. have people meters, they have mm -hmm. guesses. Amazon, Netflix, yeah. Apple, they know exactly. They know how many times you watched it, what time you watched it. They And Apple probably knows when you got up and went to the bathroom because you're wearing an Apple watch. They yeah. know everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if they're smart, this is the real, this is to me, this is really what's happened to completely destroy our society, mm -hmm. by the way. This is the nut of the, of the matter, <laughs> is they have all the data about your behavior and now mm -hmm. we have the tools to write and algorithms and artificial intelligence, machine mm -hmm. learning to completely optimize for, and this is what went wrong at Facebook, in my opinion, to optimize for maximum engagement. That just like they push a button and they went, well, we know exactly what gets people going and we can turn that up and turn mm -hmm. it down. Yeah. And, yeah. and the weaponization of attention is really it's what's happened. It happened started first in World of Warcraft and gaming, yeah. where they they noticed which drops, which loot drops got you to play more. Mm -hmm. It's happened now on Netflix. It's happening on Amazon. It's happening in every industry. It's happening on Facebook. I mean, I mean, yeah. the, we how are many superhero helpless. movies are coming out this Precisely. year? Precisely, we are helpless in the face in the onslaught of big data and machine learning. We're de we're we are just tools. I have a girlfriend who swore off almost every ad supported magazine. Like she subscribes to The Economist and she swore off almost every media except publicly supported media like PBS and NPR. How and, selfless of her. Well, no, every time I talk to her, she she's like, 
it is like I'm coming from another planet just because well, you're in a different wow. world. Yeah. Our, our experiences are substantially world. different the way that she consumes her information. And that's actually true. People who are mm -hmm. on yeah. Facebook have a different experience of life mm -hmm. than people who yeah. aren't. Yeah. And because she deliberately made a move to live in a world that's advertising free and mostly not, and mostly non-streaming the way that she pays attention to things and the way that she perceives a news cycle is incredibly Doesn't she different. get lonely wow. out there in the wilderness? No, she's a cat lady. She's fine. <laughs> oh, she's got her cats. That's all that matters. Are we, I said we were going to talk about windows, and we will, but let's take yeah. a quick break, and then we will. Lisa Schmeiser is here. I like saying your name. Thank you. Lisa Schmeiser is Schmeiser. Schmeiser. Lisa Schmeiser is here. She's uh -huh. the editor of IT Pro today. Mark, and poor Mark Millian knows I like doing that with Bloomberg Newsweek. He's a technology editor there. I haven't yet come up with any weird way to pronounce Brianna Wu. and. Mm -hmm. That's the Infinity Congress. Gauntlet. But she does that's have the. That's why. That's me. why. Yep. I'm afraid that's of her. That's it. Don't mess with me. Infinity Gauntlet. <laughs> oh, my God. Our show today brought to you by FreshBooks. If you're a freelancer, if you uh, do, you know, send invoices out at the end of the month, I don't have to. Uh, I, you, I feel your pain. I don't have to tell you what a. Just a bad thing it is that comes to the 30th of the month and you go, oh, I got to fire up Word and Excel and make invoices and send them out. And the only thing worse than that is that if you don't do that, you don't get paid. So you do it. But I've got a better way. This is a way. This is something that changed my life back in 2004 when I was going up to Canada doing the TV show. I hated to do the invoices. I had to get the expenses together and staple them onto a printed invoice and set it up. But if I didn't, and oh, and by the way, it was a Canadian dollar, so I had to do the currency conversion. Then Amber told me about FreshBooks and what a change that made in my life. FreshBooks makes it easy to do invoices. They handle currencies. You have the FreshBooks app on your phone. You take pictures of receipts. It's automatically in the invoice. If you bill for time and hours, they've got a timer built into the website or built into the phone. And the best part is it's not only easier and faster and really more professional looking to send out invoices with FreshBooks, you get paid faster because every... As soon as you use FreshBooks, you can accept credit card payments from the invoice, directly from the invoice. And it turns out clients want to pay you. It's just they don't like making, playing bills anymore. You like sending bills. So eliminate all the friction. If you, as soon as you use, start using FreshBooks and you're accepting credit cards in line, you'll get paid an average of twice as fast. No more time waiting at the bank to cash checks. Plus, you are no longer in mystery about how your business is doing because in the process of creating invoices, recording accounts receivable, accounts paid, expenses, costs, you're actually doing your books. You don't know it, but the, the, the books are getting done and you can go to your FreshBooks dashboard and look at it and you know, have I made money this month? Yes. Have I not? No. I never knew that as a freelancer. I didn't know it till tax time. Oh, speaking of tax time, you'll be glad next year that you've become a FreshBooks customer because it makes all those tax reports so much easier. It really is great. FreshBooks is a web app, so they're always adding new features. They just added a ability to create proposals with rich text content and images and customizable sections. Not only do they handle, handle currencies, they handle uh, languages too, Spanish. They just added Spanish, Dutch, German, and Portuguese. That's an option for invoices, estimates, and proposals. You could bill for time by client, but you can have different rates for different projects, even within the same client. I mean, it's flexible. It's fast. It's easy. It's a pleasure to use. And you always know exactly how you're doing. FreshBooks is always adding new features. Team member rates can now be managed from the My Team page. Uh, speaking of team members, you can add team members, either as a business partner, a basic employee, a contractor. Each has different permission sets. From payment reminders to late fees, you can automate as much or as little as you'd like. And then get back to the main point of the business, doing what you love. Try FreshBooks free for 30 days right now. You'll be very glad you did. Every day, every day, I thank Amber MacArthur for turning me on to FreshBooks. You can thank me when you go to freshbooks.com slash twit. You'll get 30 days free. Just if you would do me a favor, here's how you thank me. You write This Week in Tech when they say, how did you hear about us? Write in that form there, This Week in Tech. Freshbooks.com slash twit. Twit. If you send out invoices, you absolutely need FreshBooks. FreshBooks.com slash twit. So, uh, my friend Mary Jo Foley, who writes for ZDNet, mm -hmm. called it a demotion of Windows. But Lisa Schmeiser, you said this has been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. What happened at Microsoft this week? I think it was actually last week. Terry Myerson was last week. week? 
I think it's been a long week. <laughs> I know. I feel like, I know. All right. Well, we didn't talk about I'm it pretty last sure, week, so let's yeah. talk about it this week. So um, Satya Nadella, or rather Microsoft, made public the email Satya Nadella sent about how the company is being reorganized. They do that every year, though. Uh, not really. And um, Not like this. Not like this. I'm going to see where my uh, reference point is here. And... Uh, what they did, uh, yeah, yeah, it was March 30th that Microsoft made oh, the announcement. It's been that so, long. Yeah. Um, and the big news that a lot of people jumped on was the news that Terry Myerson, who had been EVP and leader of the Windows and Devices group, was leaving the company. And He'd that's, been at Microsoft ooh. 21 years. Yes. And he was, for a lot of people, he's the face of Windows. He's yeah. the person that, you know, if you have Windows, you have, you have Mr. Myerson. Um, and a lot of people were, ah, about this. And what, the bigger news is, however, is that Microsoft currently, or I should say had three, I'm pulling up my spreadsheet here now too. Um, they used to have- <laughs> You need a spreadsheet to keep no, track of this, kids. I, no, I, <laughs> I keep track of their earnings. And Microsoft used to report by three different groups, which is productivity and business processes, which included things like Office 365, Intelligent Cloud, which is where all the Azure money goes when they report on that, and more personal computing, which encompass the Windows businesses, plus their OEM sales, their device sales, and for whatever reason, I think Bing is in there too, Yeah. Um, which is weird because yeah. it should be. Anyway, long story short, Microsoft used to be um, organized along those three three lines and it's now um, being reorganized. So there's an experiences and devices group. So it which, was Windows and devices. It's now experiences now and experiences devices. Now experiences and devices. Yeah. And um, Is experiences HoloLens? Is it mixed reality? What is experiences? Well, they're going to be a uh, <laughs> good question. What does that mean? They'll have, they'll have the Surface in there with Panos Pane. Um, right. All the hardware's in there. Yeah. Hardware's in there. Windows is in there. Um, they will have their their enterprise mobility and management team is moving over there as well. So um, the sense I got is that this reorganization is Microsoft really saying, look, we're going to make Windows. But there's no we're cloud make and Office, AI group. But that, yeah. yeah. But that mm -hmm. really our business is going to be cloud going forward. That's where the money's yeah. going to be. That's the platform. So when I first started covering Microsoft full-time in 2015 and started going to the conferences and things like that, the message that Nadella was hammering home through all of the keynotes he did was we are a mobile first, cloud first world. And as- He was right, by the way. This is where Steve Ballmer yeah. dropped the ball. Although yeah. Ballmer's responsible for pushing Azure, so you He's can, also responsible for buying Nokia, so let's- uh, let's. So, you know, <laughs> you win some, you lose some, right? <laughs> let's be honest here. And and really, Satya Nadella came from Azure, came yeah. from the cloud side, mm -hmm. so he so, understands- So it's cloud. understandable, Sarah. Uh, yeah. so, so his first repositioning move from Microsoft in 2015 was, we are all about mobile first, cloud first. And what you'll note is there's nothing in there about Windows. There's nothing in there yeah. about the desktop. It is about- what um, Galen Grumman over at InfoWorld calls the liquid computing experience. The idea that your computing experience constitutes a set of information that you want to manipulate, you, you want to access, manipulate, and produce things with across platforms, devices, and apps. It's a liquid computing experience because it moves seamlessly between devices, it moves seamlessly between applications, or it moves seamlessly between services. And mm -hmm. to be frank, mm -hmm doesn't require Windows anymore. Exactly. So what I began to notice when um, the the next shift after that was Nadella getting up for keynotes and saying, we are on the edge of a great digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, he also they also started talking about productivity and unlocking workforce potential um, and then began pushing the idea that AI would complement humanity, not replace humanity. Totally different. By the way, we do like a whole other show just on that. Um, he and, obviously never met RoboCop. But what I noticed <laughs> is that they stopped using the word Windows in any of their keynotes. That is really weird. And they Ooh. began talking about collaboration. They began talking about AI. Quantum computing has come up repeatedly, but Windows has not been pushed out as a Marquet project or or anything that Microsoft is like, and we're making these tremendous strides. It's It's been them emphasizing digital transformation. It's been them emphasizing the cloud. It has been them emphasizing um, data data intelligence. It's been them emphasizing artificial intelligence. So the groundwork for this has been going on internally and in market positioning for quite a while. The um, reorg news that broke is pretty much just them confirming that they've basically moved their giant company towards the trajectory that they're on now, where they're going full in on services, AI, data manipulation, productivity, and collaboration. And as Ben Ooh. Thompson points out in his mm -hmm. article 
aptly titled The End of Windows. It's the first time since 1980 that the company hasn't had a division devoted to operating yeah. systems. Do you need an operating system, though? Is, is the, you don't. Yeah. I mean, we just talked about how Apple is, is probably That's privileging iOS. That's why I think this is interesting. This is, I think, related yeah. to the Apple story. I think mm -hmm. this is yes. two big companies saying, what does the future of computing look like? And how do we, how do we go to where the puck is, skate to where the puck is headed? Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, Mark, you, what do you think? Is it is this is this matter? Does Microsoft even matter anymore? Uh, yeah, they matter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, there's an essential they're, component they wanna, in they the wanna workplace. Matter. They want to matter, but they aren't really. Uh, they still have a really embedded. They have a huge advantage in the sense that they're already entrenched in so many different. But don't they environments. feel it slipping away? I mean, you talked about those stats in this in education, yeah. where yeah. Microsoft has gone from being dominant. Mm -hmm. To being a like this oh, yeah. distant second, yeah. I mean, all three companies have mm -hmm. traded places over the years. Um, if if our future is Ready Player One, the Hololens is a decent shot of getting us there. True, it's a pretty, <laughs> yeah. it's a very good product. Oh, it's the best. I don't yeah. think though that our yeah. future is. To be honest with you, I don't think it's Ready Player One. Mm. I think Brianna, you brought up a really fundamental problem with virtual yeah. reality until but, we can and, actually and, jack it into the back of our heads. Right. So we don't have nausea when we run mm. in, in cyberspace. I, I think we're going to see a lot of... solves that problem, though. Augmented because you reality. Can actually see it. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. augmented yeah. reality isn't the oasis. Augmented reality is more of... A, augmented uh, imposing, reality. Impo yeah, it's augmenting the what you're seeing with additional information from the computer. I think right? augmented reality actually does a lot to eliminate a lot of service jobs and geographically dependent jobs, to be honest. Yeah. I agree um, with them. Well, oh, one, of the most, one, of the most, one of the most one of the most one of the most sobering demos I saw was CES 2017. I went to the Intel press event, and they had us put on the little AR AR headsets. And first, we got to take a tour through rice paddies in Vietnam because it's virtual tourism, right? But then they showed us a real time streaming demonstration of a drone flying over um, a solar power bank in eastern Nevada, and it occurred to me right then and right there that if you had the drones available and you had headsets, you could basically eliminate security guards because you could pay remote workers to be online doing shift work. They might even be at home. Yeah, exactly. Sitting the in same the way, The same way that the customer oh. service industry decentralized. That and people, has happened, hasn't it? And people it? operate call centers out of their house or yeah. they patch yeah. into call They're centers. They're part of a call center. Yeah. But they because they home. can do the work remotely at yeah. night or whatever. There's no reason why with drones, anything that requires just... He, anything that requires people just to notice something and then act on what they notice, that's something that you could do with augmented reality. That's security guards. That's a reliable position that makes okay money in some places that provides steady employment that can be outsourced to somebody who will do it for much cheaper someplace else. And augmented so, reality is going to do yeah. that with a couple more classes of jobs. So I have to say, like, I think Microsoft is one of the most interesting companies mm -hmm. operating today. And, you know, like I'm a Mac fan girl. I generally buy Apple things. But, uh, you know, Leah, our mutual friend, Christina Warren, she moved over to Microsoft recently and she has an excellent YouTube channel that's like highlighting all the various things that they do. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the range of technologies that Microsoft is working on since I started watching that it, it really blows my mind. Like Microsoft is a company that has Bing as a division that makes, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars. And for any other company, it would be a major deal. We don't even talk about it as if it doesn't even exist. So I, you know, when we're talking about a future without Windows, I think the statement like, we don't need operating systems anymore. That's a little too broad for me because I do think APIs and development methodology is always going to require a concrete vision for how that's coming forward. But I do feel like, I feel like Microsoft, because they missed the mobile revolution, I feel like they're constantly being um, underrated. They're an underdog. And I think, I think generally speaking in tech, we have a very dated view about what Microsoft is, mm -hmm. what they're doing, and how relevant they are to the future of computing. All you have to do is look at their stock price. The stock market yeah. agrees with you 100%. Well, I think yeah. one of the things you, you bring up, too, is what one of my favorite um, RSS feeds is the Microsoft research feed, because you get to find yeah. out what they're working in the labs. Yeah. And one of the things that I have noticed over the past few years is um, they're doing a lot of work 
in remote medicine and telemedicine, especially yeah. in areas where you don't have a lot of infrastructure. And um, IBM similarly has begun to turn their attention to that. And I think in addition to the other sea chains, changes, what we're also looking at is a tech market where American consumers and American business needs are no longer the primary drivers for these companies. They're thinking yeah. on a genuinely oh, global scale where they're yeah. looking at yeah. new market opportunities well, that's in different is, parts right? of the world. Yeah. yeah. Because they growth have a chance. In India, that, growth in China. Well, they have a chance to define what the market, what the technology right. experience is, what the demand is, how they'll right. meet it, and and be the prime and be the first first. It's tough though. China is tough. Advantage. I mean, Windows oh, yeah. in China. <laughs> it's tough. Well, we're, we're, but what I'm saying is, we tend to look at say Europe, Asia, and the and the U.S. as your primary drivers, but the world is bigger than that. Oh yeah. And we're we're not even take. There are there are markets across say the Middle East. There are other parts of Asia. There's Eastern Africa, there are markets in South yeah. America. Ben These Thompson's, guys are all going to look at that. Ben Thompson's article, really good. Highly, as always, Ben's very smart. He, yeah, he ends it though brilliant. with, Nadella's next challenge is to, to understand that Windows is not and will not drive future growth is one yeah. thing. Yeah. Identifying future drivers of that mm -hmm. growth is another. And that's always been a historic challenge of Microsoft. You mentioned mm -hmm. Microsoft Research, which has for decades done some of the most forward-looking, I mean, since like Bell Labs. And none was, of it's made it to the market. Yeah, they haven't commercialized any of it. Yeah. They're, we yeah. Did it was very it. much like uh, Xerox Park where they invented yeah. the future, but uh, nobody uh, they they couldn't put a price it. tag on We it. did a piece several years ago uh, resurfacing this old video they showed in, I think, 99 of everything Microsoft Research was working on. And it was today. It was yeah. like cell phones and video chat. and They <laughs> nailed it. Yeah. They were so spot on. Mm -hmm. They just didn't make any of it. Wow. Well, I mean, maybe look that just shows HoloLens. it's not so oh, hard. It's actually not so hard to in, to in, think of new things. It's a lot harder to make it happen, to change the market. To Ben's point, to, to pick your battles. To, to pick like, your yeah. battles. To figure out what's important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to say, look at HoloLens. Like, this is a product that is so good if Microsoft had put more time into it and had found a way to bring a consumer version forward. I really Well, let's think be this fair though, it's not yeah. over yet for HoloLens. It, it's is, not over, yeah. but I I can tell you being on the ground, like being in developer circles, you know, talking to people that are going to GDC, um, you know, it's like technically Amazon's lumber yards mm -hmm. is still around, but it's not something developers are, are actively thinking about. Um, I feel like what I'm worried about is Microsoft has this really fantastic product that's out there, but I, I'm seeing them lose the mm -hmm. the momentum. And I think like Magic Leap might come forward and kind of take that over to, to your point, Mark. So mm -hmm. um, I want to see them be very aggressive about, you know, putting more products out there. Like Leo, mm -hmm. the, you know, the Surface uh, tablet you have in front of you, that's one of the best things they put out in years. I want to see mm -hmm. that Microsoft more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. uh, in the org, reorg, uh, Panos Panay stays with the Surface Group, and he's gonna, mm -hmm. they're going to continue, I think, to do really interesting yeah. uh, hardware. I have to say I'm the only one of the four of you using a Windows machine at the moment. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and yeah. frankly, I, this in many ways is a disappointing uh, computer. This is the Surface Studio. It's expensive, mm -hmm. mostly because it has a 30-inch super high-res touchscreen. Mm -hmm. The actual yeah. guts of the computer are fairly mm -hmm. anemic, and mm -hmm. we had a... We actually upgraded it. It had a very slow hard drive. We put in an SSD in it. And, uh, it's not got mm -hmm. the fastest processor. But where it really sings is something, in fact, that feels very much like Apple, something Apple should have done, which yeah. is with a giant 30-inch touchscreen yeah. that's just gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. And if you're an illustrator or an artist, the idea that it could sit at this drafting table angle and you can use a pen and draw. Mm -hmm. I wonder, though, I don't think Microsoft's selling very many of these. I don't think this is a big no. Success. I'm not sure they ever thought they, they would. They didn't care. I mean, it's, it's expensive yeah. by design. It's probably yeah. targeted at companies. Mm -hmm. Idiots like me. Well, this is part of your <laughs> it's perfect job. for what I do with it, though. Yeah. I don't take it. I don't take it home. It sits here on this table. You but use it for your job, though, right? Well, I use it in a way. I mean, yeah. if your job is hosting a technology news roundtable, it's perfect. Yes, there you go. It's perfect. Yeah.
I feel like the only reason I stay with the Apple ecosystem is privacy. That's mm. that's it. Well, like but that's Microsoft, a huge yeah. story it, for them now. But, isn't well, it? it's it. That's it. And for me, I have to think about messages being intercepted. And you know, Leo, we were doing a show a while back. Someone was talking about being in a security conference and how every Android phone there was pawned like within the first ten minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's. That's literally the only thing to keeping me on Apple. It's not that Microsoft hardware that I see coming out is any worse or their mail client is worse. It's not lock in with iTunes. It's it's privacy. That's yeah. it. I think that was probably one of the greatest marketing gambits that Apple's come out with in years. You is think this, it's marketing? It's this shift to privacy. I mean, oh my God. They, yes. they created social networks. They were bad. Yeah. Nobody used yeah. them. That's right. So ping. they made a virtue out of ping <laughs> and, and the failure of and ping. And they invested yeah. in cloud artificial intelligence with Siri. It's bad. Mm -hmm. So That's terrible. Yeah. The well, there, was, there was a Bloomberg Gadfly that was, I want to say last Friday, where the writer pointed out that the reason Apple can actually talk about privacy right now is because they don't they need, well, no, they don't need to sell the data as a revenue source right now. Right. They, they they're a hardware enough, company. They're a hardware company. Yeah. They're and of they all have the iTunes companies we've been talking store. about, yeah. they're the only ones that really are primarily a hardware company, yeah. not Microsoft, mm -hmm. not Amazon, not Google, not Facebook, not yeah. Twitter. Although they're, they're seeing a lot of growth in services, mainly yeah. from app store sales. Yeah, from which is I, think I would submit from ecosystem yeah. lock-in. But the that's, point, that, know. but that's how you take advantage of ecosystem mm -hmm. lock-in, is you know, you yeah. services, Apple Music, mm -hmm. App Store. Yeah. Uh, Apple did make a big hire this week. They made two. Yeah. yeah. They, two. They All right. Well, I'm going to tell you the one I know yeah. about. They hired Google's chief of search and artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. John Ginadrea. Now, mm -hmm. this is interesting because Ginadrea left Google, and like within 24 hours, they announced that Apple had hired him. I'm not sure what mm -hmm. the the exact timing of all of this mm -hmm. is but big score for apple and i think apple's saying no yeah maybe mm -hmm. siri is a flop but we're not giving up on ai mm -hmm. yeah what was the other big hire um bloomberg I'm, according I'm, to bloomberg i'm showing bloomberg more yeah, effective I love than it. you are according <laughs> to bloomberg <laughs> bloomberg reported today that um apple hired john mccormack who used to be an executive in google's advanced technology and products group yep. and he was the cto for amazon for a while Oh, that's a very interesting hire. Yeah. Do they have any idea where McCormack's going? He said vice president working on software. That's all they're saying. I, you know what? I think competition is the best thing. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing these companies poach from each mm -hmm. other, yep. uh, try to beat each other in the marketplace. Apple has a great story with privacy. I think you're mm -hmm. right. I think they fell into it by default, Mark. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly right. But it is a good story now more than ever. If it's real, I don't, yeah. you know, some of it is maybe more waving the flag than actually doing it. Uh, you know, another failure, iAds. Apple would love to have sold yeah. our information to advertisers, but their system failed. <laughs> so they couldn't. So I don't know how much they really, you know, believe in all yeah. of this. Well, although in recent years, their products have followed the yeah. marketing. They're, yeah. They are doing more device-centric processing. And, mm -hmm. and I would prefer yeah. to have an iPhone, as as you said, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Brianna, that I would prefer to have an iPhone in terms of privacy than an Android. You've got know. Secure Enclave. You've got iMessage, which has public-private key encryption, so no one can intercept the messages in between it. I think you can look at um, you know the iCloud email service. It got hacked that one time, but I think there were series about you know patching it. Mm -hmm. um, I think they've been they've taken very bold steps against government you know attacks trying to get data uh, you know in a way that I don't support. So um, I I I. I don't want to sound like an Apple fangirl, but I think I think their commitment to privacy has been very genuine, in my opinion. In fact, Tim Cook took some shots at Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg took some he shots did. back. I yeah. mean, this has been a fun thing mm -hmm. uh, to watch. Yeah. This is a good measure of how important to consumers privacy is versus a working, for instance, voice assistant. Yeah. Um, Siri still is not mm -hmm. much brighter. Uh, maybe John and oh. will help. Yeah, Ugh, Siri. Um, I just I lo I love seeing these companies play this chess game and try to win. I really do. Yeah. You want you want to see this. It's good for it's mm -hmm. good for us. Yeah. Uh, let's take a little break. We'll have some final thoughts in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. If I could, can you find for me that Bloomberg video of Microsoft in the nineties? 
I yeah, would love I to see what they thought <laughs> the world would be like yeah. today. I also want to read out this message in the chat room. Stonewaite says Bloomberg on Apple TV is lit. Yes. Bloomberg That's our new on Apple TV is Interesting. lit. Interesting. It's on fleek. It's woke. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> well, it's like Let's not go that far. Yeah. Uh, you know what's woke? You know what's great? Mm -hmm. People going down my backyard when my <laughs> ring. Oh, I love this. Spotlight cam. The floodlight cam oh. is on and the lights come on and the camera sends me a notification. Somebody's in your backyard and I say, hey, what are you doing there? And they say, huh? And then I press the button and the 110 decibel alarm goes off. And then I have crystal clear HD video of them Running the hell out of there. That's what's on wow. fleek, baby. The ring, the ring video doorbell started it all. Remember, I I installed my ring video doorbell a couple of years ago, and I just I still love it. It's just I always know what's going on at my house. Then Ring added the the security camera, the stick up cam, which is basically Ring video doorbell camera that's uh, solar powered to give you more awareness about what's going around your house and around your house. Now they've got the floodlight cam, a motion activated camera and floodlight that connects to your phone. Now you really, you you know what's going on and you can protect your home even if you're not home because all of these devices connect to the internet and give you a chance uh, to know what's going on, to speak to somebody at your door if they're, if they're leaving a package to say, hey, put it over there. I just love it. And what I also love is going to the Ring Twitter feed. This is uh, twitter.com slash ring. I got a, here's, here's a good one. Tired of the constant vandalism and theft in his neighborhood, Connor enlisted the help of Ring to stop crimes before they happen. With instant alerts and two-way talk, it was easy to stop this suspicious lurker in his tracks. This is the most recent. What's this guy doing? He's look. he's look. he's in my backyard. He's looking at my. Get away from my truck. Whoa. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir, he says, and now he's slinking away. <laughs> God, I would have run. I don't know. If a voice comes out of nowhere, get away from my truck. Anyway, the guy left. Ring.com slash twit. Thieves just can't hide with Ring. Monitor every corner of your property with a Ring of Security kit. Now, this is a good deal. It includes the Ring video doorbell, your choice of either one, two, or three floodlight cams. You know what we did? We had the... Um, outdoor you know lights on our house but they didn't have the cameras or anything and i was very easy to remove the outdoor light and these these are very they're wired so you just put them right in it was very easy i didn't even need an electrician to do it to replace it with this and now motion it's motion sensitive it lights up uh, we get a lot of wildlife out there in the back and the back 40 and it's really great to to kind of know that that's there lisa uses this to monitor our cats you're a cat lover yes you're a cat lover mm -hmm. Monitor your cats with your ring, <laughs> with your ring video doorbell and spotlight cam. She she will check to see, because we get notifications that there's a kitty cat mm -hmm. and and or actually doesn't say a kitty cat, but there's motion, and she'll look and say, oh, there's Sam, Sammy, oh, there's Paris. That's good. She's coming home. More than monitoring cats, stop crime before it happens and make your neighborhood safer with Ring. So, Leah, I want to tell you something we've dealt with is, you know, we, we obviously have people that don't like us with me running for Congress. And we deal with things like people outside our home taking photographs oh of Frank and I through the window. Oh, my God. And someone actually came to our house the other day because it's in all these public documents now and right. just put a huge dent in my husband's brand Gosh, new Dodge. Darn it. But but this this is awesome. Like this is can we, exactly can I, why. Brianna, I need. Yeah. let me contribute yeah. to your campaign by. <laughs> I don't know if this how this will go under the uh, FEC rules, but I want to send it would be you an in kind donation. It yeah. would be legal. Yes, it's legal. But I have fine. to register. Yeah. I want yeah. to send you. Uh, let me send you the Ring of Security kit. How many do you need? One, two, that. or three? Yeah. You need this. So the doorbell yeah. watches your front. Um, you might want to watch each side of the house and the back of the house. That would be the doorbell yeah. plus three. You want to do that? Yeah, please do. It's on please its way. Do. Stop crime before it happens. Make your neighborhood a safer place with Ring. Save up to $150 on a Ring of Security kit at ring.com slash twit. Ring, R-I-N-G dot com slash twit. Yo, you need this, Brianna. I'm going to send this out to you right now. Thank you. I appreciate yes. that. Mm -hmm. Lisa, not you, Lisa. Other Lisa, transitive <laughs> property of Lisa's. <laughs> We're going to send Brianna. You need it. Ring.com slash twit. Twit, and you'll save up to $150 on a ring of security kit. 
<laughs> Speaking of break-ins, Panera Bread, <laughs> Lord and Taylor and Saks Fifth Avenue, mm -hmm. which is kind of neat. I thought they were gone, but uh, apparently they still exist. Mm -hmm. um, now the FBI is uh, shutting down Backpage.com. I don't know how I'm going to meet hookers. Uh, life is really... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> On to the next story about Grinder listed here. Yeah. Well, this makes me mad. But, but not me personally. <laughs> <laughs> so Grinder, which is uh, Tinder for uh, gay men, right? Am I right? I don't know why yep. I'm looking at you, Mark. <laughs> Grindr is <laughs> Tinder for gay men. Now, this is a weird story because when you set up your profile on Grinder, there's a field you can put in your HIV status. Of course, that's part of dating in the, uh, as a gay man. Yep. And the last time you got uh, tested. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> so... I think if you put this in Grinder, that you have the reasonable expectation that Grinder, this is sensitive material, mm -hmm. is going to at least keep it to itself. I understand it's on your profile, so anybody who goes to visit your profile can see it. You've published it, in effect. But the presumption is it's going to be other gay guys looking for dates, and so mm -hmm. I don't mind sharing it with them. Grinder, meanwhile, in order to improve the performance of its app, shares this data with third-party app performance oh. companies. Now, Grinder says, well, you made it public, which I kind of understand you did. So this is a problem where, of a perception problem, where really, I mean, obviously, if you think about it, you put it on your Grinder page, you made it public. So anybody yeah, can see it. Yeah. But at the same yeah, time, I understand true. internally, you might feel like, well, yeah, but I didn't expect them to give this to some third party. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, back to uh, Backpage, because I'm a straight man, and I want to meet... <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, this is actually surprisingly controversial. Backpage, which I gather, based on its name, is was mm -hmm. replacing the back pages of uh, those weekly newspapers oh, weekly, you yeah. find around uh, town. Uh, and was primarily, I don't know, primarily or often used by uh, sex workers mm -hmm. to solicit. Uh, been shut down by the FBI... Sex workers are upset because that's great. You, you send us right back out to the street. Is mm -hmm. that really the, yeah. the consequence you want of this? But it, but yeah. it's illegal still. So I don't, mm -hmm. this is another one where I don't think the, it's obvious. Apparently the Justice Department uh, worked with uh, attorneys general uh, mm -hmm. in California and Texas to shut down the website. A court mm -hmm. in Arizona mm -hmm. uh, has sealed the case. So we don't know all the details of the seizure and so forth. You know, my campaign doesn't like it when I talk about this. But I bet. I, I, to be, I, I have to be honest with you. I am a sex-positive feminist. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can have women's liberation without having sexual liberation. And, um, you know, I think we need to find a way to make sex work, um, you know, safe and legal for the people that participate in this. This is part of human nature. It's always going to exist and pretending it's not something that's going to happen is just going to make the women and men that do it unsafe. Um, I I'm do not say in favor, child. and I know you're not yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're about to yeah. say this. There's yeah. This is not sex trafficking of children, and that's right. horrible and that's offensive. That's what I was about to say. That is a really big problem, though. And we, it's, there is a really big problem with that trafficking uh children and also women from other countries into the United States. It's a bigger problem than people understand. I've talked to experts on my campaign on that, and it is something that we need to aggressively look at. But I have to say, I don't think making sex workers unsafe is good policy. I just don't. I think we got to find a middle ground. Uh, and, I agree. and there is some evidence that Backpage was used to facilitate sex trafficking with mm -hmm. minors yep. as well as adults. Yep. Yeah. And, and of yep. course, for that, and if they knowingly su supported that and facilitated that, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. But yep. I do think there should be, we should find a way to support sex workers. Not necessarily, I, I need, they need to be protected. I agree. I'm not running it for Congress, though. You're crazy yeah. to talk about it. No, I, I, I really think, you know, Leo, something I've found is like um, marijuana policy is a really good thing. I think 10 years ago, a politician coming out and saying, you know, I'm very much in favor of federally legalizing marijuana. I think it would have seemed ridiculous. It is a mainstream opinion now that gets a huge cheer. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think that like, you know, the internet has opened all of us up to like a more 
honest version of how all of us live our lives. I, you know, I have sex workers I follow on Twitter. They seem like nice people and I want them to be safe just like I want anyone to be safe. It's just how I feel. On the links between Backpage and sex trafficking, a January 2017 Senate report accused, this is from Wired, accused Backpage of facilitating online sex trafficking by stripping words like Lolita, Little Girl, and Amber Alert from ads in order to hide illegal activity before publishing the ad. Yeah, but if it's not in the ad... Mm. They're saying the, They're saying the, the users page. would file. The would, users would, knew it was in would, the ad. Would write in their ads these words, yeah. and the website would strip it out. Well, they should refuse yeah. the ads, not strip Ex it out. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's yeah, okay. That, that, All that's right, so maybe there's more to this story than we uh, meet the eye. Here's yeah. a story that there's probably more to this story than meets the eye. Intel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they make those nucks, those little computers, and uh, uh, people attach them to the back of a TV, mm -hmm. but they don't have a keyboard and a mouse. So Intel mm -hmm. made a really nice little program, Android and iOS, called Remote Keyboard, let you use your phone uh, to type on these. So it was really nice for people using nucks for media centers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. On Tuesday, <laughs> Intel discovered some critical flaws, bugs, that allowed privilege escalation and people to intercept typing. And instead of fixing it, they just said, oh, screw it. And they <laughs> pulled down the app. <laughs> That's a new way to fix problems. Ah, screw it. I just, <laughs> we're going to just, no, don't, don't, don't use that. It's not worth app. that. Not worth that. <laughs> we could fix it, but why? <laughs> Intel said, no, we were going to pull it down anyway, but it is kind yeah. of an interesting coincidence. Um, <laughs> I hope this is not the new way to fix flaws oh just delete the program for crying out loud you don't really need that isn't that kind of the the moral equivalent of have you turned it off and turned it back on yeah again? yeah <laughs> we're just gonna delete it that's too yeah. and agit pie's yeah. harlem shake video which was on the face of it incredibly oh. offensive Ugh. when he oh. killed net neutrality but showed you all the wonderful things you could do with the oh. internet mm. in a harlem shake video which also showed that he really was behind the times mm. Uh, the FCC says now the C the video preparations must remain secret. What? <laughs> so the video was shot with Daily Caller, which is a conservative news site, just before the vote to repeal net neutrality. Uh, uh, reportedly, one of the dancing partners was a proponent of the pizza, of the bogus, completely bogus the pizza, pizza gate, gate theory. So, uh, uh, Muck Rock executive editor jay pat brown filed a foia request mm -hmm. saying you know i'd like to see the emails between the daily caller and the fcc as well as any talking points mm -hmm. regarding this quote huge pr coup four months later the fcc responds we have the emails but we're going to take advantage of the b5 exemption regarding deliberative process and no and can't. this is the second time the agency under agitpi has used the same exemption which is a deliberative process privilege on a stupid YouTube video. There was a, <laughs> yeah. there was a Verizon, the, the video they did with Verizon. That so they do this also, a lot, I guess. Huh? Well, at least twice. Yeah, it's a total abuse of, uh, of the law. The idea of the law, the B5 provision, is to protect mm -hmm. free and frank debate about policy options, not yeah. to avoid embarrassment. <laughs> to the chairman of the FCC. You know, if you have to use government policy to hide your embarrassing YouTube videos, maybe don't make them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe just stop making the embarrassing... No one is making you make those videos. Pull an intel. Say, you know, <laughs> forget it. Just, I, I'm sorry I did that. Can I say how heartbreaking it is to see just how instantly it went from us having this vote to destroy something that's so important to a democracy... <sighs> To you, know, you drive past T-Mobile or you know any other wireless store nowadays, and they're already advertising their policies Eight. about getting right. free right. videos right. because of yep. destroyed net neutrality. Yep. And it just it churns my stomach to see just how quickly we are throwing something so critical to a free society away. Yep. It it oh, it just it makes me sad. You know, last night I thought it'd be fun. I wanted to watch something light, mm -hmm. uplifting. Yeah. Reddit Reddit uh, Mike Judge's Idiocracy. No. <laughs> I started it's watching. It's a documentary. Yeah, yeah, I'd seen it many times and thought it was very funny. Mm -mm. It's not funny anymore. Um, <laughs> we had a neighbor who, um, in 2016, their campaign sign in their front yard was for Camacho. Uh, whatever. Oh, really? Was. Well, it was until about. The day after the election. And, and they then, pulled that one down. Yeah. 
it's, yeah, it was, it's a documentary. Yeah. No, and I think I think that finally hit my The name. premise of it is yeah. that the society, and it takes place mm -hmm. at like 100 years from now, the society has guys gotten dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber mm -hmm. to the point where you can't, you can't get a doctor because nobody knows anything anymore. <laughs> and um, oh, it was just depressing. It was like, oh. The, just the president is a, a World Wrestling Federation mm -hmm. <laughs> A reality star. TV yeah. star? That couldn't Ooh. happen. We also, had a real, we also have a reality TV star in Congress, too, because you're forgetting there's a member of the House of Representatives um, who was on The Real World Boston. <laughs> really? I didn't know yeah. that. What? Yeah. <laughs> who is this? Uh oh, Brandon wants to know. I'm trying to remember what Sean's last name is now. That's funny. Googling for the real world boss. Because I remember well, watching. Jesse Ventura wasn't the worst governor we've ever had. No, but yeah. um, uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> hold on. Um, I just yeah, hope it's, The um, Rock doesn't isn't serious. Yeah, about it was Sean, Sean Campos. Um, oh my god. Oh, excuse me, Sean Duffy, who's now Sean a congressman Duffy. from Wisconsin. Well, wasn't the I, guy, uh, uh, yeah, the uh, long-standing congressman? Wasn't he like mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the gopher from the Love Boat? Was yeah. a member of Congress, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. you know, at the height of Gamergate, I had three different offers to come in and be on reality TV shows of because you they thought, of and I'm like, nope, this could be bad for my career. <laughs> I'm so glad I said no now. So just so, a word of warning. If you're thinking, yeah. tonight would be a great night to watch Idiocracy. It's yeah. too depressing. Oh. Let's Too soon. Oh. <laughs> too soon. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Brianna Wu, 2018.com. If you'd like to support this brave and strong <laughs> woman for her run to win the Massachusetts 8th and bring some common sense into the House of Representatives. We are so all for you. And that in-kind donation is on its way. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. I appreciate that. I, the I, site that's on your screen right now, it's still being DDoS'd oh, as man. far as the... Uh, I know some people at Cloudflare I could hook you up with if you want. All right. We may talk. I'm not too happy at Nation Builder right now. But uh, if you want to support us, you can go to supportbrianna.com. That's still up. That is still For up. the moment. For the moment. <laughs> I, it's so frustrating. So <sighs> frustrating. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk. Mm -hmm. Let's not hide in the shadows and be jerky jerks. I agree. Lisa Schmeiser, who has the best name on this show, editor IT Pro today. She's at L Schmeiser mm -hmm. on the Twitter. Yep. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Love having you on the show. Thank you for your insights. Mm -hmm. And of course, the fabulous Mark Millian. Who I've known since he was a small child. <laughs> Technology. Not true. Not true. <laughs> Technology. Well, since you were like 20 something, like you were yeah, 21 or something true. when you started on this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we used to have you on as the token young person. <laughs> Do I still count for that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, Technology. Yeah, yeah I still like oh, that yeah. guy. Technology editor at Bloomberg. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for Likewise. being here. Thank Excellent. you all for watching the show. It's really fun mm -hmm. to do it with a, a live studio audience. We thank you guys for visiting from Arkansas. How how did how did Shelly do? Is she all right? She said she she survived. Okay, good. <laughs> she was she was the long suffering. Sp Every time we have visitors, there's usually a long suffering spouse and a fan. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's and and uh, so that was the long suffering spouse role for you today. Thank you for being here. If you want to watch live, just email tickets and twit.tv. We'd love to have you. You can also, by the way, watch live on our live stream at twit.tv slash live. But if you do that, please join us in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. The chat room really writes my, my best lines for me. Great resource, irc.twit.tv. We do the show live Sunday afternoons, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. Uh, but if you can't watch live, you know, like with everything, on-demand uh, video and audio for all of our shows available at our website, twit.tv, or in your favorite podcast app. Please subscribe. That way you'll get every episode every episode thanks for being here we'll see you next time another twit this is amazing doing the twit